Okay, we're rolling. Welcome. Hello. Hello. In the beginning. This is, this is different intro music, right? Because it's Franco yeah, Clanko. Yeah, I usually do the Galactica music for uh, Franco Clanko. <laughs> like it. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Ooh, with special guest Scoot, who's never on the Franco Clankos. He's always on the Franco. Oh. <laughs> He's on some of them. He's on most of them. Yeah, I, don't know. I wasn't on the last Oh Yeah podcast. It's true. Where you guys talked about New York. You guys got kicked off that. You got kicked off that show, and now you're on this one. That's, yeah. that's a downgrade. Sorry. This is this is a smackdown. <laughs> yep. Other ones raw. I'm sure Speaking. Artie's got uh, stand in memories. I don't know. Oh, you want to start happy? What do you got? No, I, I was just going to say uh, he mentioned SmackDown, so I was going to mention Becky Lynch got her face smashed. And- I saw yeah, that. Yeah. Chucky, uh, Chucky's like, you guys see this. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I'm telling you. she I, Her eye looked like, well, at first it was all mangled. Her face was all mangled. But then when she went to find her successor. To, to work yeah. is, is it Smackdown that's coming up well it's uh, a Survivor, Survivor series Survivor which series, is uh, right. they, they cross they cross the two the two brands right Raw versus Smackdown excuse me yeah, um, yeah I started getting her successor by that time her eye looked like a David Bowie album cover yeah, yeah it did. <laughs> didn't it? and her face was all swollen up yeah <laughs> <laughs> she's my favorite too she's been my favorite for a while and, really uh, yeah it's, a, it's always a runoff between her and Alexa Bliss but I've always liked her more and and uh, man, they replayed that shot she took from Nia Jackson. Oh yeah, and, uh, it crushed her face. I was like, "Holy crap!" Yeah, she's was, Irish, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I was wondering what her accent was again. I, I, she's the uh, Irish last kicker. I think uh, Flair's daughter looks like a blonde share. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, man. Okay, uh, she I'll, looks, looks kind of you. plasticky, right? <laughs> yeah, and plus she had like her whole outfit and everything. So it was it was share take me home share. What about do you believe? <laughs> <laughs> I that's yep. that's literally one of my favorite uh, Buffy episodes when she's it's like her first week in college and she's got the annoying roommate who keeps playing believe over and over and over again. <laughs> no matter how hard I try. Oh. I like I, the Charlotte Flair has taken over the the dad's gimmick with the woo. I know. Now she sh- now she should just go ho. Oh! Instead, in the, in the exactly, ring. but she, I do. I like when she woos because, <laughs> woo! It's like yeah, okay. <laughs> I am Spartacus. Yeah, sure you are. No, she's, right. she's going to wear that that little navy thong and be on a battleship and run around going. <laughs> if I could turn back time <laughs> with it with an auto tune going whoa 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 or something. <laughs> I remember that. That was wasn't wasn't that the first song to have an auto tune on it. Believe I'm sure it did. I'm sure it I did. I think I think it was. I'm sure I, it did. Not 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 sure. It's me talking, so you know it's right. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> um well and I'll you know, Cher can still sing. It's not a question of she you know, it was fine. She just put a little digital tribble to her uh, voice and everything. Oh I need time. Yeah. yeah. But that was the the, the auto tune, yeah. The, that was, was the it auto tune? Because I mean auto tune's when they obviously correct your pitch. And that thing to me was more of just a digital kind of. No, but it was the first song with that 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 featured the the auto tune. Okay, uh, and okay. then it was the demise of every other song after that. <laughs> okay, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna look it up. Sharon, look it up. You'll know I'm right, uh, and then we'll I'll have, have to sign it. off because I'm gonna have to go celebrate. All right, exactly. It's 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 your birthday. Birth. Congratulations. Birth. Yeah, try not to tell anybody about it though. Thanks, appreciate it. Well, welcome to Burf. Didn't they say about? Didn't they talk about it on Facebook? Yeah, but I, I know I don't I don't make a big deal out of it because I'm old now. I know. So. Welcome. So you know you're still uh, you're still in my can, area. Can you buy beer yet? I think so. I think they let me sometimes. Okay, once again in the second in second paragraph, belief departed from Cher's pop rock style of the time for an upbeat dance pop style. It featured a pioneering use of the audio processor software Auto Tune as a voice of. Thank you, thank you, thank which you. Again, known night. as the Cher effect. 
this has been an episode of the Franco Clanko where Franco is always right episode. You've done yeah. it again, Holmes. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I, I keep telling I'm, people. I'm not I Nigel. don't know a lot, but the, the amount of useless information I know is astounding. I'm Nigel uh, Bruce. <laughs> I'm, I'm not only Watson, I'm the <laughs> incredible Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> no smashing, idea. smashing exactly. Holmes. <laughs> it's, you know, it's really funny because he was, he was really the first knuckle. He's the first auto-tune Watson because he's like knucklehead Watson. But all the <laughs> other Watsons were not as smart at Holmes as Holmes, but they weren't stupid either. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Lassie's owner. <laughs> well, you know, if Artie was here, you know what he would say, right? No. All I love. That's what he would say. <laughs> <laughs> this is James Robinson imitation. Mm-hmm. Hello, no. mm-hmm. nice. It's truth. Nice. Did you know Franco's always right? That's right. It's true. I conceived oh. of Franco to be the always writer. I, I, I was. I was said. I was said by the. Who news. wasn't said? Yeah. yeah. That's how I first started. When I first started hanging out with all you guys, we talked about Stan Lee the whole time. It's true. You, you know, you know what I, I, you know what I did love about the day he passed away is every single person in my universe calling or texting me to tell me about it. I know, me too. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for reminding me every two seconds. Thank you, Stanley. Is dead. People who are yeah, are not in comics. Thank exactly. You. Did you hear? Stanley is dead. Yeah, I know. Thank you. I know. Thanks. I had the same thing. My sister, including including my sister. Did you know? Yes, I know. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, apparently, though, from my Facebook feed, nobody's more sad than Spider-Man because I've seen a lot of Spider-Man tribute drawings where he's sad and Stan Lee's up in the clouds looking down on him. That progression yeah. of the panels when he's got his uh, head in his hand and crying. Yeah. What's that? What's that from? It's from uh, uh, the it's from when, when Stan Lee, Stan Lee died. Yeah. Is it? Is it? Because it, it, it looked like it looked like Silver Age Spidey. Right it probably was. It looked like it came from a book, like maybe when Captain Stacy died, maybe when I know it wasn't Gwen, or when Harry, uh, Matt Sally, you know, yeah, exactly. You know who apparently is an asshat, Johnny? Who? Army Army Hammer. Why? What did he do? <laughs> he he posted something about uh, uh, saying, "Hey, way to pay tribute to a legend by posting a picture of yourself with the guy." All the cell- you know, like oh yeah, to, all the pictures, to all these yeah. celebrities and stuff oh, like that. Please, wow, way to go, Army. Yeah, and I think uh, who who called him out on it was uh, I have no idea. Um, Negan, really? Uh, not our not our Negan, but oh uh, Jeffrey. Uh, yeah, Jeffrey three named uh, Jeffrey something Morgan. Jeffrey Dean, Dean Morgan. Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Like. Yeah. yeah, I love Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Called him an ass hat. Wow, <laughs> that's hilarious. That does not surprise surprise me. Now again, I don't have a picture with him. But I have spent quality time with Jeffrey D. Morgan, and that does not surprise me. That's funny. I unfortunately I never I never got close enough to Stan. I know you guys, you and uh, Artie, obviously had your moments yep. and, and pictures and stuff. Scoot, have you ever had you ever met the legend? No, I've never met him. But I've been to so many of these shows where we've been eating breakfasts or something, and he's like walks right by us, or he's a table over. Uh, but Three I've never tables I've never away. Met him. Yeah, but he's always heavily guarded. The one year at yes. Cincinnati, he was there, and I never saw him in the green room, but he was there. I saw him like a bunch of times in the hotel and stuff like that, but sure. I never uh, never talked to him. I think the last time I saw him in person was uh, New York Comic Con, probably either 20, I think 2014 was the last time I saw him. And um, he was sick. He had, he had like the flu, but he still, you know, Soldiered on and, you know, made an appearance and was signing at the Marvel booth and yelling at the people. I'm fine. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's uh, it was weird timing. Um, I was already planning on having a talk with uh, Fred Van Lenty because he has a new novel out called The Con Artist, which is a really great murder mystery that happens at San Diego Con. And it's incredibly detailed. And you do, I mean, it, he captures every moment. And, it, 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 you know, anyone who's been at San Diego would really appreciate this is a murder mystery because you could feel the atmosphere uh, while he's writing his story. And I, he also wrote the comic book history of comics for IDW with uh, Ryan Dunleavy. So, obviously, he's written a full comic book history, and obviously Stan is a huge part of that history. 
So, yeah, we were already scheduled to talk, and uh, he emails me and goes, hey, i got to push back our talk for a half hour. The BBC just called and wants mm-hmm. me to do a, a you know, comment about Stan. I'm like, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we had to switch gears, so we, we, we had a, a nice Stan discussion, a nice uh, yeah. extemporaneous Stan discussion. I listened to it. It was a good a good one. Was it all right? Because we did, you know, we I'll admit we brought up, you know, his relationship with Kirby and his relationship with Ditko yeah. and how they didn't work out. Yeah, no, I think it was good. I mean, I mean, you got to – it wasn't all roses, so it yeah, was good. It was, yeah, we just wanted a full kind of portrait of the man. And not to yeah. not to put him down, but just be like, hey, that's what I think partially what made him interesting and complex. Right. Was talking yeah. about that side as well as, you know, the great stuff too. Yeah. Well, anybody who doesn't think another human being is human yeah. is, yeah, is just, you know, built up this persona in their head and they don't, they don't get it. Yeah. I th- thought it was funny because, like, uh, I noticed a lot of people on Facebook and social media, they didn't understand, like, which character specifically he created. So there'd be, like, a Deadpool, like, Stan Lee, like, he's mourning Stan Lee yeah. or something. And I was like, well, he didn't really create him or, like, Wolverine. It was right. like, yeah, that's not, that wasn't a Stan Lee guy, you know. But I didn't post anything, you know. But yeah. Well, the, again, I think, yeah. That's- I think a lot of people think he that are just because so many people now know the characters from the movies, and right. I think they think Stan Lee just created every single character in all these right. movies and everything. Well, you know, like yeah. that people small. people not in the know or outside of comics, just yeah. every every Marvel yep. character and some and, DC characters, and, <laughs> and, and that's yeah. and that's actually to Stan's credit as a promoter because he 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 was gave off that vibe of like the father of comics so like right. the yep. casual fan knows like he created a bunch of characters now specifically which ones maybe it doesn't matter because right. he did create so many of them but to us it matters obviously but um that's just a testament to like right. how well, good of a promoter exactly he was. i was like, just gonna say you yeah. know it's a testament to the man himself because yep. uh, i have a friend who who whose daughter um uh has down syndrome and uh he he talked to her about you know Stan Lee because you know she saw it on the news, mm-hmm. and um, and she said um, Mr. Marvel died, like yeah. you know even to someone like that, uh, you know like and she's a young girl, um, so like even someone as you know to young people they know Stan Lee and they, so, yeah. they associate him with the movies, yeah, uh, anyone that's watched it, so you know it's a testament to the man himself, yeah. I said, oh, like, I said like Tupac, he's going to have like four or five more cameos in the can. Yeah, that's so. what I was just going to say. I wonder how many more. I know he probably has filmed it for Captain Marvel and the next Avengers because those already shot. But I know Spider-Man Homecoming sequel is shooting right now, so I wonder if he got his cameo in, you know. Well, like I said, I heard, I heard, I heard rumors like that he had – yeah, he, he did a bunch of them like last year or something like that, yeah. like the next few or something like that. They'll just slot him in. Gee, be- I see up in the sky that's Captain Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's gonna be there's gonna be a day when there's there's no there's no Marvel movie with a, a Stan Lee. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cameo. I think we're five years away from that, based on the pace of the scheduling and the and the likelihood that we'll be seeing these. Be about like three or four years. Why isn't he in the Star Wars movies? Well, or they'll do like in uh, Hero Six, and it'll be uh, animated Stan. Ooh, remember that. At the end, yeah. at the, the after credit scene in Hero Six, yeah. that was oh, awesome. spoilers. I was going to watch that tonight. Too. I heard he's in a Teen Titans Go movie too. Is he truly? Yeah, I heard. Oh, I did hear that. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. And neither yeah, have even I. though I he can't. didn't create any of those DC characters, I think he has a cameo in that movie. What am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Is Lagoon Boy really Namor's son? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Fred was saying, and yeah, I mean, we we that is cute how he did promote himself into the world thinking anything with Marvel was likely created by Stan um, I didn't remember this but again I trust Fred being the historian that he was he said in the 80s Canon Films announced in Variety that they were making a Captain America movie and we don't think it was the Matt Salinger Ronnie Cox original and the Ned Beatty Captain America movie Ron, um, Ronnie Cox exactly um and uh, that it said in the ad, uh, Captain America created by Stan Lee. And it's like, yeah, not really. <laughs> Don't let Jack see that ad. 
<laughs> uh, that's not true uh, at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it was interesting. And yeah, I, you know, the and also the other thing, and this is to Stan's credit, prior to the Marvel age in the 60s, starting with Fantastic Four, every other age of Timely and Atlas, their goal was to be almost literally the second best publisher of whatever genre because superheroes took off and national was kind of leading the way and timely was number two and then during the war they kind of were still doing superheroes but they went away and uh vince fago was the editor-in-chief of marvel while stan was at in the army and they were doing funny animals and dell obviously was number one and there was marvel and then horror ec comics and then there was marvel you know i mean it's just they they just kind of always fought and then even in the 50s and it was funny. This is another thing. Before the Mar- Marvel Age, you got to kind of credit Stan for co-creating the kaiju, the American kaiju uh, movement with all of the monsters, the giant monsters that they created. Yeah, well, I was I was reading something. I think it, I was reading Ross Ritchie's post on Facebook. Ross Ritchie about uh, he he's the he's oh. the guy over at uh, Boom. We and, love uh, that he guy. Did, he's awesome. He, he did a few uh, projects with uh, with yes. Stan. Yes, they did. Uh, a few years ago, and he, and he said that uh, at one of these um, meetings or something like that, he he brought him in to to meet everybody at Boom, and he pulled out like a, a comic that Stan had written in the 1950s, where the guy was, um, you know, hunting these these robots or or humanoid looking robots or something like that, and in the end, he turned out to be one. Um, and you know, Stan said he didn't remember writing that, and then they got to the end, and it was basically like the plot of Blade Runner, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and oh, he's wow. like, "I created Blade Runner," you know, type thing. <laughs> um, you know, so I thought uh, that was funny. Th- for those line of heroes, he asked Brian Bendis to be one of the writers. It ended up being, I know, Paul Jenkins wrote a character or two, and also, hello, love, uh, Paul Cornell. Mm-hmm. Uh, both British, hello, both hello, love. Um, but Brian took the meeting and he was really emphatic both on the podcast and to me about how, like when Stan was pitching this to him, he's like, seriously, the level of energy and this was not like an 80 something old man. Cause I think he was still in his late eighties at that point. Mm-hmm. He's like, seriously, this is like talking to a peer. He was so excited and it was yeah. organized. He, he knew exactly, you know, what he wanted to do with each hero and it was, you know, all fleshed out. And, you know, honestly, um, and it's another thing Fred and I talked about, that late period of creation of stands from, you know, the 90s till, you know, probably those boom projects and stuff. And a lot of those were like Stanley present animated movies that would wind up on Encore and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, you know, and the whole Stanley media experience mm-hmm. of the 90s and early 2000s. Um, yeah, you know. There weren't, they weren't necessarily great characters, but I give him credit for still, you know, throwing crap on the wall and seeing what sticks. And mm-hmm. and also, um, Storanko was in Chicago doing a pulp show, and someone asked him around the time of the DC Just Imagine Stan Lee stories. And the guy's like, you know, isn't it kind of disappointing that, you know, see Stan still trying or whatever? And Storanko was very sage, and he's just like, you know, literally since 1940... Stan has written stories for every genre, from superheroes to westerns to Millie the Model, right? Everything, Patsy Walker, and the funny animal stories. And it's like you know he's written literally like five or ten thousand stories. He's like, yeah. I-, I think I can cut him some slack if the you know if they don't <laughs> if they don't stand up to the the classics that he wrote during that amazing ten year period. Right. So you know. yeah, and and to speak to his, you know, I I I, I never worked with you know, uh, Stan at all, just had the pleasure of meeting him a few times. Um, the, the, the first time I met him, um, you know, it was very, it was very quick and it was, you know, these, these pet answers, you know, that he has rehearsed, you know, um, where, you know, I walked up to him and I said, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, and, and he goes, well, it's a pleasure to have been met, you know, um, type thing is. And, uh, so those are the quick answers. And, and I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, he's, he meets, you know, tens of hundreds of people a day sure. you know uh, and he's got these answers down and then the second time where we actually got to spend some time with him and talk to him 
Um, I was impressed that, you know, like you see these interviews with him and you're like, wow, he's kind of quick and on the ball, but you meet him in person and he's quick and on the ball and he's, he's got these, you know, snappy comebacks and everything. And not all of them are rehearsed because, you know, you're, you're in the moment of a, of a spontaneous conversation. So they can't all be, you know, um, those rehearsed, those stock answers, um, and he was just like really, really with it and on the ball and his enthusiasm for things are, you know, it's, it's contagious. And I, I, I remember saying to Art at one point, I'm like, you know, after meeting him, he, he's like the most important guy in the room <laughs> to yeah. himself, you know, even, even to himself, but he makes you feel like you're the second most important guy in the room, you know? And it, and that was kind of cool, you know, to have that kind of interaction with him. And really? one of my favorite pictures of all time was this guy, uh, Bruce Bruce Guthrie. He was a photographer at Baltimore, and he captured the shot that's on my my Facebook page uh, of me laughing, and that's Stan Lee making me laugh. Um, <laughs> and and uh, it's it's like my favorite picture by far. Um, cool. Yeah, I just realized I know uh, a piece of oh yeah trivia. Franco is the only one of all of us to have met Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, right, Franco? That's true. Wow. And George Lucas. Wow. That's right. I knew about the Lucas one. What was the Kirby meeting? Uh, he met Roz, too, right? Yeah. It was, uh, it was years ago at a, at a New York convention. It was one of these, you know, um, I, I want to say it was a, like a Fred Greenberg show way back in the, in the New York comic show days. And, um, uh, he, I think I've told this on on the podcast before, but he was he was standing there waiting for his wife, uh, who was chatting with someone, and he was just like you know, not not behind the table. He was kind of off to the side by. And I remember, you know, those big room partitions, the dividers that they would roll out, you know, at a convention hall to divide like one one side from the other. Yeah. He was kind of standing near that, you know, and and I'm like, oh, that's Jack Kirby. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna go say hi to him because he's you know by himself and and i walked up to him and i i introduced myself and i said you know it's, i just wanted to say i'm a i'm a huge fan and and uh i just wanted to meet you and and he was very nice he chatted with me for for a little bit saying oh you know what do you like and what do you do and blah blah, blah. and i'm like well you know aspiring but i don't know if i'll ever get there type thing you know and and it was just cool to to meet him i i don't you know i don't really remember what i talked about because i was kind of nervous sure. you know <laughs> But um, yeah, it was cool. That's awesome. Eisner is the only master that I would say is on that level as well that I met face to face, and I know you guys met him too. Yeah, he made fun of me in art, so that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, I had my Warren Spirit uh, magazines, and as the paper got older, it looked like uh, peach colored paper. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and he was just like, "Oh, I haven't seen these in years," and he was flipping through them. And uh, he signed him for me. It was at the Ch- University of Chicago. Was having a humanities festival. Oh, oh. and uh, and it was great. It was it was him and um, Scott McCloud and Neil Gaiman interviewed uh, Will and uh, Art Spiegelman was there. So it was a very you know um, pointy headed uh, setting for a discussion about comics all weekend. But it was great. And uh, and because it was that kind of college lecture hall atmosphere, they did their speech in the big one of the big lecture halls, and afterwards we're just hanging out in the in the lobby of the hall, and you could just uh, go up and talk to anybody. And so yeah, I was talking to uh, Will and I was talking to Neil. Very cool. It was yeah, it was good. But yeah, it was not Stan, unfortunately. I never Scoot, had the opportunity. Scoot had his first encounter with uh, Neil Gaiman back in New York, New York Comic Con. He turned him into did. the little. Uh, yeah, remember we were coming out of the diner and that guy oh, walked past us yep, and I said, right. there's Neil Gaiman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he walked right past us. <laughs> and Scoot's like, was that him? I'm like, yeah, he's right there. Yeah, it's New York oh, City. Cool. Nobody cares. He yeah, just walked down the cared. street. He was walking down oh, the street. Sure. <laughs> well, it's like um, Kelly Sue DeConnick always says, we're comic book famous. And it's right. like, yeah, believe me, you know, it's like, yeah, it's nice inside the arena, but as soon as we leave the arena, it's like we're just another schmuck right. on the street. And it's true. It's absolutely true. Occasionally, occasionally that bleeds into the outside world, and it always catches me off guard. When when it does, it's it's been far and few between. Let me let me preface by saying that. But I understand. Um, you know, walking through Times Square, somebody stopped me and started talking to me, and my wife was like, "Who's that?" And I'm like, "I have no idea." 
Oh, yeah. He was talking like he knew you. I'm like, well, yeah, he's a fan. I just. Mm. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, oh, you know, I uh, Mike Gold was in town. Mike like Gold, he's yeah, the old DC editor and first comics editor, and uh, we had a very nice dinner on Monday night, and we were. Uh, he was telling me, I always forget that he was one of the original organizers of the original Chicago Comic Con. And I said, because oh, wow. I was associating him with First Comics and, and DC. I'm like, I don't know how many interactions you had with Stan. And he said, oh, yeah, when I organized uh, the Chicago Comic Con, he goes, our first two guests of honor were Jeanette Kahn and Stan Lee. He's like, that's how I got the job at DC. He said, but no, I spent a lot of time with Stan back then. And he said, and you know, over the years, even when I was working at DC and stuff, he goes, yeah, I'd, I'd obviously run into him in New York and things, mm-hmm. and fu- various functions, things of that nature. So, uh, no, Mike was great. We were we were cracking up. No, we not only were talking comics, but we were talking about uh, old Chicago radio and TV because he used to, you know, he grew up here, and before he got into comics, he was uh, a broadcaster here in Chicago. Worked at a couple of the same radio stations that I did. We have a few. Mutual, mutual friends. Mutual. So, yeah, he's he was great, funny as hell. Mm-hmm. Good stories. Good times. Good times. Good times. Good times. I'm gonna get a water or something because I've got incredible dry mouth right now. Oh yeah, I got something like, here. It sounds like spider webs are coming out of my mouth. So you yeah. two talk so much to each other. I yeah. hate you both. Yeah. Jeez. Wow. Hates us, right? Wow. Why is it yeah. gonna be like that? What's I don't know. Here? Sorry, I was taking a swig. A yeah. Swig of stuff. Yeah, I haven't talked to you guys in a while. I've been uh, moving. I still live in the same city, but I just moved to a different house. You still have both houses, or did you sell the other one? Um, the other one's pending, yeah. Oh, yeah? Oh, so cool. Hopefully, it'll sell pretty soon. Nice. The other house is the model home of that I used um, for Wrapped Up, where my little mummy lives. So if any listeners out there have read Wrapped Up, that's what the inside of my house looks like. Oh, well, there you go. See? Yeah. yeah. I think that's yes. why uh, I sold the house. It was a wrapped up fan, you know. Yeah, you're done. Yep. You're wrapped up, literally. Mm-hmm. So uh, now, now that you're done with the move and everything, you're going to start drawing comics again, or what's the deal? Yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. I know. Yeah. It's been hard to um, be consistent with it since we, everything was like, my computer was hooked up, but things were in boxes and you know, staying up late trying to get the houses you know, if we weren't working on the current house, we were moving stuff out of the other house. We still have a couple of things to get out this weekend. So, right. but hopefully over the, uh, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas time, we'll be able to catch back up and get back to where I was. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, constantly doing stuff and it's, uh, I feel like I'm perpetually behind all the time yeah. on everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I already been busy. Yeah, I don't. I, I haven't talked to any of you guys since the last. I've talked to Artie like once or twice since the last podcast, but I haven't talked to any of you guys. I know. Um, and you weren't even on the last podcast. No, I wasn't even there. Yeah. Yep. Skoky Spidey. Skoke. You guys talked about him. Yeah. Yeah, but Good old nobody Skoke. Else. I haven't even talked to him in a while. He was texting me for a little bit there. We're sharing our New York stories back and forth. Yeah, he, he texted me when he got back. Uh, home um and he said someone in the uh in the airport thought he was justin timberlake <laughs> so <laughs> they kind of freaked out he, he he saw their face and he knew exactly what it was and he goes oh here it comes <laughs> so that's funny that is hilarious oh okay it's, it's finally back he doesn't hate us anymore yeah yeah it's over i no longer hate you i'm oh, good now good, that good. i have uh, now that i have iced tea um, yes, I'm very proud of myself. I've mastered the iced tea making technique, and I'm sure everybody else was like already doing this. But you make like uh, you know you boil tea and you put like three tea bags in, and you make a real, real strong, real strong. And then you add ice water and you get it to that t- consistency you want it to be. Did you uh, did you just find this out in 2018? How long have you been on this I planet? Know. I know. Well, you know, some people do like the full giant gallon jar, mason jar, new sun tea, and they'll just leave it sit out and brew. And, you know, they don't add water to it or anything like that. They just brew it and drink it. There's those people, too. Actually, I learned it when I was a barista at Starbucks in between radio jobs. 
Mm. They would have like a quart of really, really intense tea. And then as people would order it and stuff, they would they knew how to measure it. And it was like, you know, half the intense tea and then they, the real cold water. Mm. Boom. Instant tea. Perfect. Tea. Instant perfect tea. So, and then so I Johnny, also, you're a big I wrestling flash, fan now, huh? I flash freeze it. Yeah, I'm a big wrestling fan. No, I was Sweet. at Chucky's. I was at Chucky's, and uh, he's like, "Do you mind if we watch?" I haven't finished watching SmackDown. I'm like, "Sure." And that's when we saw the Irish uh, Lass, the whipping Lass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah. last kicker. The last yeah. kicker. And then I, uh, yeah, and then, like I said, because I, I saw the uh, they kept replaying the beatdown that she got, and then they showed her choosing her successor, and I'm like, "Hey, she looks like a David Bowie album cover." Gene Genie. <laughs> That's awful. Why would you do it's true. Like that? Well, well, that's what like it looked almost like because I'm sure they touched it up with makeup or whatever. But um, you know, it almost looked fake. But I know it wasn't because I saw the beatdown she got. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that. I don't know that I'd be able to take a shot like that. Damn. I thought you have. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just oh. the way your face normally looks. Hey. Oh, wow. Oh. Hey! That's well, right. thank you for tuning into this episode. Yeah, we're, um, we're not speaking now, anymore. Now that it's done. <laughs> wow! Wow! I literally have not spoken to you since the last podcast, and and that's the way you treat me. Wow! It's kind of true. We've only texted each other in the last few yeah. weeks. Mm-hmm. Oh man! Sorry, buddy. I'm yeah. sorry, buddy. Yeah. Avengers: Infinity War fan theory suggests. That Stan Lee is going to Strange did not die in the snap. Oh, oh man. He's the, just, yeah, yeah, all the heroes are going to come back, and, and he's the one that's going to crumble. That's yeah. what Latino Review says. So. <laughs> is it really from Latino Review? No, I never it see their be. posts anymore. I don't either, man. Maybe they disbanded. Maybe they don't I like think, each other anymore. I think Artie and I were the only ones that, uh, that read their articles. <laughs> that subscribed to Latino Review? Yeah. It's just in. <laughs> 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 Breaking what, news from Latino what else, Review. What else does uh, Latino Review? <laughs> That's awesome. Do? Um, I'm trying to think. I'm way behind on the CW shows. I've got them all on DVR, but have not sat down to watch any of them. And uh, yeah, I haven't watched them. Or Daredevil. I, I was I was due to talk to uh, Guggenheim, and we had it all set up. And hey, how you doing? And I started recording, and whatever reason, my software wasn't working. And I'm like, all right, I'm not going to waste your time. We'll reschedule. Eh. But he's a sweetheart. He's a great dude. But I wanted to talk to him before the big crossover coming up. Elseworlds, Black Superman outfit, Lois Lane. Yeah. Everybody wearing each other's costumes. Man, that must be stinky. <laughs> yeah, I need to catch up on all that stuff because it looks really fun. Oh, God. Yeah, I can't wait. I, I you know, I mean, I, based on the photos, you can kind of figure out maybe what's going on. But uh, that's fantastic. Very exciting. And then uh, the Aquaman movies coming out, Franco. Meanwhile. Aqua. Aquaman. Meanwhile, Aquaman. Aquaman. And he wears his orange costume, it looks like. Yeah, I saw pictures. I like it. I want to get a costume fitting now. It's thrilling. It's very thrilling. I don't know if I would I would look the same way in the orange costume. They'd have to let out the midsection a lot. There's I a think guy, I, there's a guy yeah. I met in uh, at the Salt Lake shows, and I Salt the Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> and his name is Mike, and I forget his last name, but uh, he was a uh, big giant dude, and um, he was cosplaying as Aquaman, and he kind of had a gut. And then last time I saw him, he really lost a ton of weight, and he's, and he's still doing Aquaman. And I'm like, dude, nice going. And then I saw an even more recent uh, picture, and he cut even more weight. Mm-hmm. And now he's, like, totally back in shape. It's like, holy cow, man. He totally went from, like, you know, Joe, Joe Bag of Donuts body to, uh, like, he's cut. And I'm like, all right, now you're Aquaman. Now, how, how did, he, did he do that swimming? I how have no idea. Cut? Yeah, he might have. I don't know. He looked fantastic. But I'm like, nice going, man. I, like it. I was very oh. impressed. Salt the Lake City. Yep, they're going to have two mm-hmm. shows this year. One in April and one in September. I got to see if I can go or not. I'll see. You're going to go to both? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Mm-hmm. I'd like to, but it's it's got to be the right uh, circumstances. So, because my fortunes have changed. So, we'll yeah. see. We'll see. Um, what else do I know? 
Are you still on the air, Johnny? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm on the air, but, you know, it's just I'm not full-time like I was last time I went to Salt Lake. So, um, you know, yeah, I just got to make it work out and make sure that it's, you know, I can afford to go, basically. Yeah. And that's what, that was the choices of uh, Terrificon and even New York. So. Yeah. It's just the way it is until things change. Or continue to improve. Is. We'll see. We'll see. No, things yeah. are going good. <coughs> Blah. 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 No, Get and right more. now on the on the pot on Word Balloon, I've been uh, alternating with uh, guests and talking about great Christmas presents. And I had, do you know Bob Greenberger, former DC um, I've heard the name, but I don't know. Okay, he um, just came out with two count them two two um, big coffee table books, and one is the Justice League's hundred. Is one of moments. is one of them about coffee tables? Exactly, Kramer. No Cosmo. <laughs> and it actually folds out to be its own coffee table uh, of a book. Uh, I love this guy. He's crazy. <laughs> um, but no, one's the hun- uh, Justice League's 100 Greatest Moments, and the other is DC Heroines' 100 Greatest Moments. And then in the spring... Oh, oh DC, DC Heroines, not Heroine. No, Got not it. Heroine. No. Yes. Cutting lines with Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff seems watered head. down. <laughs> Hey now, there you go. Uh, I should sorry. know. That's excellent. Uh, no, yeah, DC heroines hundred greatest moments, and then the Justice League, and then in the spring it will be DC villains hundred greatest oh. moments. Oh, man, I'm telling you, they're good. They're very good. They're um, they're very good. Well, they are because they, you know, he he has the list obviously, and he gives analysis of each you know reason why he thinks this is a big moment, and then you know he also has like the not only the couple panels here and there but he'll have like full pages of the scene that like you know shows like one of the great moments like for the the heroines book he had um and i and it was a terrible event our worlds at war wasn't that what it was called dc event and uh, that's when uh hippolyta or hippolyta hippolyta wonder woman's mother dies oh and it was spoilers and it was phil jimenez who wrote and drew it and I had totally forgotten about this incredible, intense scene where it Love was Phil. It, it was like Bambi, like Wonder Woman's running around like mother, mother, like she finds her body and she's like, it's all right, mother, it's over. And she's trying to like wake her up. And she's like, mother. And it's like, oh, not was it like Bambi? Did someone like shoot mother. her off camera? No, but oh, man, I, I was watching that. That's a great American experience. The two part Disney uh, thing that they did. And Oliver Platt is the uh, narrator. But they show that whole sad scene of Bambi. Mother. Oh, my God. It rips my heart out every time I see it. Man. Very harsh. I, I don't know what's gotten into me, but as I get older, I seem to get weepier. Oh, yeah. And I was watching some um, – I was watching – I was telling my wife today that I was watching some video on, on the social medias of this little kid who um, had some sort of um, – uh, issue, and I'm not quite sure what the issue is, so forgive me, but um, you know, they're at Disney and a costume character, you know, someone dressed as Winnie the Pooh, was just so gentle and kind to this kid that I'm like watching this thing and I'm like weeping like a baby. Yep. <laughs> and I feel ashamed to be a man sometimes, <laughs> but you know, what are you going to do? I understand. I was doing that with uh, dog videos. There was like one of all these people like if your dog could understand you, what, what what would you say to him? And it was all these people. It's like, even though you keep tearing up my shoes, you're my best friend, and I love you. And you know, and it's like, hey, I love you too. I don't even know you, dog, <laughs> but you're a good dog. Is it, and clearly, is, your, your your masters like you too. What is, what is it? Why why do we do? do I don't know. Do man. you have this affliction, Scoot? Or are you still young enough to to not weep at things like that? No, yeah, it's. I thought it was. <laughs> no, um, I thought it was when I had when I had uh, a kid of my own. But Johnny doesn't have a kid, and he weeps. So I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know. No, you're right. I uh, no, it's sad. I know uh, that as soon as I like, I nothing would phase me when I would watch movies. But the minute I had a kid, like a year or so into it, you know, there, there's this movie, and I forget. I think I think it's a Robin Williams movie where oh, some kid oh, falls where? into a. 
a oh. hole or a well or something like that, and I'm like, oh, I, I, oh my god, I can't watch. Oh my god, oh my god, it's like that. Fa- <laughs> it's like that episode of Family Guy where where Brian finds out he has a kid, and he's like, he's like, oh, ever since I had a kid, I can't watch. Oh my god, oh my god, I, I, I can't watch it. I can't watch it. I can't watch it. <laughs> and I, I, that's me. Like I can't do that anymore. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I know nine eleven really like soft, like tenderized me. And there, oh, there man. are just some things that were too emotionally intense. I'm like, yeah, I can't handle it. We're, we're just, we're just hitting all the happy notes tonight, aren't we? Yeah, I know. It's this the worst episode. I know. <laughs> this is the worst episode. I created Wush Man. Beige Man. <laughs> Now's the time for Beige Man. Man. He and Gary Marshall are up there. <clears throat> a great idea for yeah. a graphic novel movie. <laughs> You got Electra, you got Daredevil. They fall in love. I didn't create Electra. <laughs> now he, now he's, you know, he's clear minded. Yeah, he's up yeah. there, and he's, you know, it's not, old, it's not old age screwing with his memory anymore. Oh, that's yeah. right. I didn't create Electra. Boy, the, I, boy, is I my co- face red. I co-created Spider Man. <laughs> I, what is? I consider Steve Ditko. The yeah. co-creator. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to ask me with a gun to my head, I would consider. <laughs> Always the qualifier. God bless. Isn't it? Man. Isn't it weird how like people our age know? Before we even knew Stan Lee or or his image, we knew his voice. Yeah, from those cartoons. Yeah, Spider Man and his amazing friends. True believer. Ooh. Yep. VD, not me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't have a rubber. memory. Don't worry. Yeah, I don't have a memory of not knowing who Stan Lee was. I feel like for as as long as I can remember, he's just been associated with Marvel. Like even as a little kid, like I don't have this memory of being like, oh, that guy created Spider Man. It's just been like a known thing my whole life. Like, oh yeah, Stan Lee, he created all those guys. Well, you know, I kept finding, and I was glad I found him because they're all over YouTube. <laughs> Uh, when I heard he died, I was posting like his game show appearance on To Tell the Truth from like 1971. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. And it's awesome. And it's great, too, because, you know, before they do the whole, like, uh, in, you know, when they start asking the three people who, you know, to figure out who, which one's the real Stan Lee, uh, they always start with like a little uh, thing that the the real person writes. I am Stan Lee. I am the uh, editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics or the whatever he said, publisher. And he's just talking about how comic books are more relative today than ever before and, you know, whatever. And it was great. Gary Moore had, like, a whole stack of Marvel comics, and he was fanning through them and stuff. And it was Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, I want to say Arlene Francis, and or maybe Kitty Carlisle. I think it was Kitty Carlisle instead. And I forget who the other guy was asking the questions, but it was really interesting. Oh, Bill Cullen. And they're like, you know, uh, so uh, uh, the comic books these days, they're, uh, they're not written by the artists. They're, they're, they're two different people. Yes, that's right. It's uh, two different people now. And do you, uh, do you draw them? No, I, uh, I just write the stories. Yes, yes. But it was great seeing, you know, vital 50-year-old Stanley talking. And also even earlier, 1968, I found this great black and white show that he was the host of. And at first, I thought it was other comic book creators he was talking to on a panel, but no, it was all counterculture uh, news people from the '60s, like writing those great like underground newspapers and stuff. Oh. And so Stan was kind of the hipster with with these guys, and they were just like, you know, do you consider yourself a subversive journalist? Are you an activist or are you a journalist? And you know, he was just like kind of leading this panel, and we're going to rap today about today's social issues, the hippie movement. <laughs> You know, just various topics and stuff. And it was very dry, but it was weird. It was a black and white film. And I don't know if it was made for, like, a pilot for a New York show. I'm not sure. I'm assuming that was the case. It was probably made for, like, local New York television. But it was cool seeing him, like, you know, again, closer to his prime. Yeah. Yeah, I watched this funny, um, I don't know. No, it was a podcast I think I was listening to. Um it was similar to the one that you just did, Johnny, where they were talking about Stan, and it was like the Marvel method, you know? Sure. And how um, eventually he just 
call someone into his office and be like, let's do a story about Fantastic Four and they're in Africa. And then Kirby would just go draw the whole thing and bring it back to him. It was yeah. like the Marvel method, like just evolved into that. And then you guys did a similar one on your uh, podcast too. Yeah. With Fred. Absolutely. And well, you know, um, I've heard Ramita Sr. say that they would take like long family car trips and he would like figure out a Spider-Man plot on the, on the way. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just kind of send all the finished art to Stan, and well, and Stan even admitted yeah. that he'd and that I would dialogue it. Well, yeah. you know, that well, was the whole big. No, that sounds good. And, that's like that's good. I want to get that gig. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> he, uh, I, I've well, done that, a few things like that over that the years. BBC nice. in search, that BBC in search of Steve Ditko. That was supposedly one of the big uh, complaints of Ditko's, where you know. He would draw Spider Man going over it like a crowd of teenagers that were yeah, protesting. Yeah. <laughs> and in Ditko's mind, you know, Spider Man's like, Oh, those idiots, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And Stan would be, Hey, face front, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I was like I thought it was like a like a union workers were on strike and then Spider Man was like something like, Yeah, those guys need to get to work or something and then and then Stan took it and or Ditko wanted it, like that's what he thought, and then yeah. Stan took it, did like, Hey guys, I'm with you. <laughs> that was it. Stuff like that. And yep, Ditko. Man, we lost Ditko this year. Yeah. Yeah. How's that for irony? The I know. Now we got to listen to that um that radio show when Kirby is on that show and Stan calls in, but we got to imagine was, it's like I know. it's in they're in heaven and, and then Kirby's up there talking oh. and he hears his voice, "Hey Jack," and he's like, "Oh hey Stanley, <laughs> I finally <laughs> found a cloud that yeah. I could be peaceful at after all these years of searching. I have finally found my moment of peace. Hey Jack, guess what? This is the best cloud I've ever been on. <laughs> oh hi Stanley. Oh damn." <laughs> That's sad. Everybody, everybody talks about the riff, but you know they they had to have something together for working yeah. so long together. You yeah, know? no, they did. Oh, yeah, did you guys see Kirkman's uh, Secret History of Comics? Uh, no, they uh, that was great. It was on AMC. It was it was a really good documentary series, and he talked about the whole, you know, the this the if you will see me side of you know Marvel and Stan and uh, unfor- the unfortunate. Endings of relationships and stuff, and he described. They described some sort of party. Well, after that radio interview, where it was a big room or whatever, and you know, I don't know which one of them was for you know there first, but then the other one came in and they saw each other and they smiled, and they hugged each other and were laughing and sharing old you know good memories and stuff. Mm. So you know, I don't know. It's it again. It's complicated. I you know I get it. I and especially. You know, Stan was a boss, and and Jack was a worker at that point. Yeah, and yep. it's too bad because you know, again, the tables had turned back in 1940. Well, did I hear something Stan, like Jack was his boss? You know, yeah, but didn't I hear something somewhere? Or read something somewhere about when Jack was making the move to DC to keep him from going there. Um, Stan offered him or or tried to get the up the uppers to to persuade him to stay by offering him like you know overseeing the art director or whatever the art director and he'd be getting paid even more than stan or whatever and and uh i I remember reading that somewhere again if if you believe it then i'm gonna say it's true because i'm usually right about my lessons exactly (laughs) and they and then i believe that stan asked him while in auto tune yeah (laughs) hey jack Jack, do you believe in love (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I need time. <laughs> That's awful. Come on now. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, no, not even an auto tune, Stanley. I'm, uh, I'm I'm joining Carmine and uh, creating a fourth world. Jack right. would be like, "Hey, you, get off of my cloud." <laughs> Literally. Oh boy. I like it. Oh man. No, I know. Well, and I always say that uh, Fred and, uh, Van Lenti and uh, Ryan Dunleavy's comic book history of comics, one issue always ends with, uh, it's like the odd couple. With nowhere else to go, Jack appeared at the, at the home of his childhood friend, Stan Lee. Hey, Jack, welcome back. Welcome back to Marvel. And, and, and poor Jack's got, like, the saddest look on his face. 
Oh, all right, Stanley. No one else will <laughs> hire me. I guess I'm coming back. And it, it's and it just like Stan is just beaming, smiling. And then also for one of their covers, they recreated the uh, Fantastic Four number one issue one uh, cover with uh, the Mole Man's monster coming out of the ground, and you know everyone trying to attack it. Oh yeah. And it's uh, it's Stan, and he's got a big smile on his face and stuff, and and Jack's like kind of in the forefront, looking really sad. <laughs> and Steve did goes on like a Spider-Man uh, web, trying to uh, attack Stan. <laughs> it's funny. It's really you'll find it. It's either issue four or five of the comic book history of comics. There. Yeah, I'd like um like I was saying again about like he was always so enthusiastic about his characters. You know, a lot of creators nowadays get kind of like I don't know, like if jaded's the right word, but they're yeah, like, I, ah, I want to do the next thing. And Stan was just always like such a good promoter of Spike. He never talked bad about any of his characters. You know, he was proud of all the stuff he made, yeah. which is kind of cool. Well, and also, you know, still doing the comic strip. Yeah. Yep. And that was real. He really, he was, you know, dialoguing and plotting the comic strip well along. And uh, Alex Saviak was inking it, but it was cool. It was uh, Stan and Larry Lieber, Stan's mm. brother. Mm-hmm. Uh. So that's an interesting relationship. Yeah. What and I, didn't talk, I didn't talk much about it with Fred, but I had uh, Danny Finger off uh, on like a year or two ago, around this time of year. It was like November or December. And we talked about Larry. Because I'm like, you know, Larry's like, you know, literally the quiet brother that you just never heard from. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what do you know about Larry? Because Danny was, Danny was very close to Stan. And always, you know, had Stan in right now and, you know, constant. Uh, stage Q and A's and stuff like that, and and I think was even helping write one of Stan's biographies. Yeah, mm. I like Danny a lot. Danny's a Danny's a good keeper of the Marvel flame. So Slot, of course, Slot always had great stories about Stan and him. Nice. I like Stan. I like Slot. I like Slot. I like the lady. I like Dan Slot Spider Man stories. I like Stan Lee. I have lots of pictures with him. Me and my various wives at my various eras. <laughs> I bet he has a picture. Stan has pictures of him, Don, and Marla, Ivanka, and um, Ringo. <laughs> Marla. <laughs> Marla Maples. Marla Tiffany Malago. Trump. Tiffany Trump, the Trump no one talks about. Well, that's she's not real. I'll be at the mall. Okay, okay Tiffany. All right, <laughs> Tiffany. Yeah, didn't I see her just once before the election? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. never heard from her again. And I then I saw her on argu- inauguration night, and that was it. I think she. I, I mean, I really think she's in her very early twenties. So, you know, I think she's uh, just happy to be a kid, sitting on a pile of cash. Yeah, hey, write her a check. Can- Leave me alone. What else can we say about Stan, though? Uh, he had a mustache. Oh, he wore yeah, sunglasses beige. all the time. Beige. Yep. His toupee yeah, had various colors over the years. I'm surprised more people didn't pick up on the beige because I see a lot of these tribute drawings and they got him wearing like green or brown or black, and it's like he wore beige a lot towards the end. Yes, he did. I feel like we're the only ones that really picked up on that. <laughs> I like earth toads. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, like I was kind of seeking out. Um, <laughs> I couldn't find it, but I know he wrote a novel either in the 80s or in the 90s, and it was a World War II action novel, and it featured like uh, one of his – it was a character that was in Marvel fanfare. It wasn't Sergeant Fury. It was another sergeant and another kind of World War II battalion. Huh. And I kept looking for it. I couldn't find it. I found one of his alien uh, stories that he wrote in the 90s or 2000s. But not, like it was weird. Not only did he you know, keep making animated movies and new comic books, but he was you know, still trying to write no- novels and stuff, too. Yeah. I remember that line, the, the 2099 line at Marvel. He wrote uh, Ravager? Rav- oh, I didn't know that. Character. He wrote one of the regular monthlies? Yeah. Wow. Um, because it was uh, Punisher 2099, Spider-Man, Doom yep. 2099, okay. and then there was a... There was a Fantastic Four book as well in the original phase. And the, I, and the that one I, I don't remember the best that. because 
that one I love the best because it was year one FF, and they were in 2099 and trying to survive because in, you know, like in a in a in a future they didn't create. Right. But yeah, it was cool. I but there was, was a cool. there was a character yeah. named Ravager, and he wore I think I think that was the name, but he wore like a green coat. Look it up, Johnny. Use those magic sure fingers. Make me look it up. But all right, fine. Yeah. Hold on. Was it? Did it turn out to be Doctor Doom? No. Uh, well, that was the mystery of Doom twenty ninety nine. Was was, was, was it really, really yeah, was Doom it, or not? I, yep. I remember that. That was Warren Ellis. Doom twenty ninety nine. But well, Spider Man twenty ninety nine came out of that, and I loved that costume. Yep. And that was yep. Rick Leonardi, I think, was drawing that. I loved twenty ninety nine. But I got all the titles, and I don't remember the Fantastic Four one. I just remember Carl, the, uh, Carl Kiesel wrote it. The Ravager, or no? I'm saying the Fantastic Four one. Hold on. Uh-huh. Uh, Marvel twenty ninety nine started in nineteen ninety two. One possible future of the Marvel universe. Uh. It was originally announced by Stan in his Stan soapbox. The later, this later changed to a line of books under the banner. Oh, it was uh, being developed by Stan and John Byrne, and it was originally going to be called the Marvel World of Tomorrow as a single series, but it turned into a line of books. Um. So Doom twenty ninety nine. There was Ravage Ravage twenty ninety nine. Yeah, uh, that's scripted the book. for several months by Stanley. Yep. See, so told you. Yep. I know things. But then, yeah, it said the 2099 line soon expanded to include 2099 Unlimited, Fantastic Four 2099, Ghost Rider 2099, Hulk, X-Men, and X-Nation. While it has been confirmed to be a possible future of Earth 616, the mainstream Marvel Universe, the 2099 Universe has officially been designated as Earth 928 and alternately dubbed as Earth 616 circa 2099. Huh. Uh, that was a lot of lot of stuff. Yep. Uh-huh. Paul Philip Ravage was Ravage. Yeah, I Jake remember Gallows, that was the, Jake that Ellis was, was the twenty ninety nine hu- Punisher. Miguel O'Hare, of course, Spider Man. John Eisenhart was the Hulk. And then Ken Shiro Zero Cochran was Ghost Rider, and Doom was Doom. Victor Von Doom. <laughs> I remember the Ravage was real hokey. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. I didn't realize that the Fantastic Four 2099, I think, were actually clones of the originals that were... I do remember that. There you go. Now, now that you say that, yes. Yeah, because that was always it. weird. Why were they Why were they yeah. the same? Yeah. 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 See? That was interesting. And, no, I, and that, like I said, that was the one I liked the most because... They were young and innocent, Fantastic Four, like, out of their element, but surviving. It was cool. You want to go back and read all that stuff now? I hear you. Well, it's, pro- it's probably on Marvel Unlimited. I don't have... I don't, you could read for a simple $70 a year. I don't have time <laughs> to... My, my comicsology is getting screwed up all the time. I don't know. I wanted to read the, the latest Mr. Miracle issue. And luckily, I get it like in 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 paper form. I actually get the book too. But uh-huh. like, yeah. I was like, "Oh, you know what? I'm going to sit and read this comic today." And I cu- I couldn't get it downloaded, and and it's just like ridiculous. I hate it. I hate On it. On Wednesday, I was at uh, I was ha- I was visiting with Chuck, and um, he has a store by him in Schaumburg, and it's called Keith's Comics. And truly, and don't get me wrong, because I always say this, and I mean it. We have the greatest stores in the Chicagoland area. Among them, Oh Yeah Comics. Oh, yeah. Stokey, and our dear friends at Challengers and, of course, Chicago Comics, where I know live, you know, around the corner from. And those 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 guys that we dislike so much uh, from Challengers. Yeah. Really? yeah. Patrick and uh, yeah. Dal. You but don't no, like them? That's what I'm saying. There are so many great stores. And this Keith's Comics, every time I go there, I could easily drop three hundred dollars in comics Whoa. because they have the most incredible back issues, as good as any. St- I mean, honestly, literally, I was in Midtown Comics during New York Comic Con, and it was the first time I had ever been there. And it's a great store; it's incredible. The one in Midtown, obviously. In Midtown, yeah. <laughs> hence, hence the name Midtown Comics, and um, you know, right off Times Square, obviously, and it's a great store. 
this Keith's Comics, this little hole in the wall store, I found as many like, oh my god, I can't believe this is in stock and it's right there and I can buy it now, mm. just like in Midtown. Mm. And I'm just like, this is. And I was telling Chuck that I'm like, dude, this store can compete with the best store in Manhattan. Yeah, it's, it's of, weird, oh, you know, like stores, uh, you know, great, great comic shops. Yeah. Brother Bear at the New York, oh yeah, comics. You know, I talk to him a lot, and uh, he's always picking up these comics, you know, like and putting them up online. I'm like, where did you get that? He goes, oh, some guy came in with it. Yeah. I'm like, that's awesome. He's been getting some really cool comics. That's that's terrific. Well, and I would imagine too, being in the you know kind of uh, around Manhattan area and stuff, that a lot of great collectors probably had access to a lot of great books. Right. You know, so I bet they are floating around in Manhattan oh. in that way. And the same, yeah, same with, you know, Chicago was obviously a major hub as well. Hub. Toledo. Nobody, hey. Nobody, nobody goes You know, there. I was uh, reading my boxing history, and one of Jack Dempsey's great fights happened in Toledo. Oh, yeah. I believe the Jess Willard fight when he won the title. How's uh, how's your Big Bout podcast going there, Johnny? I haven't had good. a chance to listen. Good. Yep. Yeah, it's I'll be right cool. back. really good. Oh, man. I'll be right back. He hates us. He's watching Oliver, who can form complete sentences now. Yeah. I know. It's scary, right? I'm telling you, he's a little person now. I know. It's crazy. Yeah, but, um, yeah I'm he's not a big boxing fan, growth. so I haven't, I haven't listened to any of your stuff there, Johnny. I understand. It's okay. Uh, no, it's been fun. Um, I have had a few Chicago broadcasters that are big fight fans on. And uh, also, there's a great magazine, Ringside Seat. And a lot of the original Ring Magazine uh, writing staff that had been there for years, um, Oscar De La Hoya's uh, promotional company, Golden Boy, bought Ring Magazine a few years ago. And, you know, kind of in unfortunately, and I don't think it was Oscar's personal decision, but in typical corporate fashion, you know, fashion, they got rid of a lot of people and brought in their own people and yeah. stuff. And uh, so those people just stayed together. And they started a new magazine, and it's called Ringside Seat, and it's terrific. It's amazing. The, you know those uh, Tomorrow's publications, like Back Issue yes. and Alter Ego mm-hmm. and stuff? There's a, there's a design guy. Mike Cronenberg is his name, and he does a lot of the covers for Back Issue. And, in fact, did the most recent issue with uh, Christopher Reeve and a whole look at the uh, original Superman movie or the 78 Superman movie. And... Um, Mike is the number two guy at Ringside Seat, and he does all the layouts and the graphic design for the magazine. And it's just beautifully laid out. They always find these incredible paintings for their covers, uh, either new things that they commission or uh, great retro covers that they're able to get the rights to and stuff. And um, great photographs, great articles, really, really good writers. And it's amazing. And um, I, I, Mike, because of his interest in comic books as well, he's a huge Tom King fan, as we all are. And, um, you know, I, I approached him about being on Word Balloon last summer. And he did one of the Tomorrow's uh, soft, soft cover uh, collections called The Batcave Companion. And it looks at 70s Batman. And um, it was him and Mike Urie that co-wrote it. And he did those, or I guess it was it was either sixties and seventies or seventies and eighties. I think it was sixties and seventies. And uh, Mike Geary did the sixties portion of the book and really focused on all the sixties writers and artists. And then uh, Mike did the seventies, and uh, you know Frank Robbins and uh, you know Don Newton and some of these other you know Jim Aparo of course and Neil Adams of course. Um, but you know all the different looks of Batman from the seventies. And he's a true Batman and comic book aficionado and also a big fight fan. So I had him on over the summer, and we, yeah, we talked about both. And he's one of the guys who's like encouraged me to start the podcast, and it's been great. And so I've had a few of those ringside seat people on as well. Uh, Bill Detloff, who used to be the ring uh, editor-in-chief, we had a really good conversation. And the current ring editor-in-chief, Doug Fisher, a really, really nice guy and a, another big comic book fan. He and I talked. Um, so, yeah, it's been fun. Nice. You should talk about wrestling on there now. No. It's like, you know, the, my podcast liaison at uh, Blog Talk Radio and Spreaker, Amy, is is like, you know, it'd really be good if you talk MMA as well. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not into MMA. I'm like, I, I like it enough, but it's it just not not as much as I love boxing. And I even got the two streaming networks, ESPN Plus and uh, DAZN, DAZN, because they have regular fight cards every weekend from all over the world and uh it's great 
I'm telling you. I feel like uh, the people that have like the NFL package are you are or the, the WWE. Oh, uh, I, I, you must have cut out. The, are they doing ads with you, or, or you said those two those two um, outfits no, are doing what now? No, I'm, I subscribe to their oh, services I see. Okay. so I could stay on uh, up to date with all the boxing stuff right. because um, they're kind of the new power in boxing because they've got the money and everything. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure you read ESPN is getting out of the boxing business. Uh, ESPN or HBO? Or, or I'm sorry, or HBO. HBO. Right. My brain. That's like when I said okay. I had interviewed Buzz Aldrin on the <laughs> one of the Franco Clicos. Oh. When I was it, really it, uh, sick, <laughs> I, you you believe you had, so I I was going with you. <laughs> I uh, I talked to Buzz Aldrin, and uh, <laughs> I'm on a lot of Nyquil here, so <laughs> exactly. I, talk, I am. On I talked the moon. to Buzz Aldrin and all the Martians. I talked to all of them. <laughs> it's true. I talked to John Jones's sister, <laughs> like on Supergirl, Miguel, Miguel. Miss Martian. The Titan it's good Martian. night. It's, we could start our own podcast, Scoot. Our wrestling podcast. Feel free. Let's do it. Yeah. I like it. I, I can't record anything, though. But I could talk about it. Could right, Johnny be on it? Tech Saver. Yeah. Although right now, right now I can't be on it because I hate you both. Hold on. Wow. Wow. The second one. Number two. Second one. Oh, I'm eating pretzels right now. But now his drink went right through him, so that's why. <laughs> Johnny's talking about all this stuff about wrestling and you're talking about moving your house and I feel yeah. like I haven't been outside in like a week <laughs> you're becoming uh, art it's literally um, I told this to my buddy the other day um, at work like I, I I am so antisocial not on purpose and not well, by you do design. hate people but I, I do, mostly. But um, he was out for a couple of days. He was sick. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I was talking to, you know, I talked to people across the hall and stuff like that. But uh, I said to him, you know, I said, you were out for two days. And I, in those two days that you were out, I did not speak to an adult person at work <laughs> in those two days. And it was just like the weirdest thing. And the realization had come to me when I was talking to him in his office, like the next day after he had gotten yeah. back. <laughs> so you just yeah. kind of came in, went to your class, then when the class was over, just went home. Yep. yep. <laughs> just you know, interaction with the kids and stuff like that. But I really hadn't spoken to an adult. Yeah. In, in the in the two days that he was out, I feel like there's a Seinfeld episode somewhere in there. It's like yeah. George purposely avoids adults for a day or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, on purpose, but yeah, just happened that way, and I just realized afterwards that yeah. Do you ever just eat your lunch at your desk at at work, or do you go to like a cafeteria? To oh no, no, no! I hate going to the. Uh, I don't go to the cafeteria because that's just I don't know. It's just the f- they don't even serve food there. <laughs> um, but uh, the teachers' on I never go there. Never. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I've been there about 20 years. I think after the first year, I went there for like the first four or five months, maybe mm-hmm. three months, and I walked out of there. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't. I can't. I can't be in here. The teacher's lunch. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna just start taking naps in your desk, like George Costanza. <laughs> Under the I desk. think you're you're becoming George Costanza. I, mean, I didn't think I was that bitter. No, but you're becoming. You're not there. <laughs> what does it take to become a George Costanza? Or his Just father, like Costanza? Avoid, avoid adults for like the whole year. Like don't talk to any adults when you go to work. And then like sleep in your desk if you have to. <laughs> what I miss? Uh, how we avoid adults. Yeah, I like it. Franco said he that. didn't talk to an adult at work for two days. <laughs> yeah, because I was hanging out with this. Year going? It's all right. Yeah, yeah, it's a school year. Yeah, nice. It's, um, Bring. Yeah, I like. Yeah, I like being being in the classroom with the kids, but it's uh it's like you know, 
it's uh, the, the 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 school stuff that I'm like it's it's uh, playing down me. You know, after 20 years, it's it's uh, getting old. Yeah, well, not old, but yeah, yeah, mostly. <laughs> you know what I mean, Jenny. I know exactly what you mean, sir. Yeah. Now this is what uh, Mike Gold and I talked about too. Me this teaching? Is, well, no, just in terms of <laughs> well, working for other people, and you know, as you get older, it gets yeah. harder. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of don't want to deal with you know. I think you ought to do it this way. Really? Well, <laughs> here's why I'm not doing it that way. But thank you. Good stuff. Man, uh, Mike Gold met, and I know the name won't mean anything to you, but I want to tell you who, why he's famous. Oh, I he's, know that person. Exactly. Herb Morrison. <laughs> Herb Morrison. Oh, my gosh. Herb? Yep. Herb Morrison is the guy. Herb's like you, go way back. Well, it's, you, <laughs> might not know, you, you might not know the sound bite, but he's the, he was the reporter for the Hindenburg. It burst in the fr- flames. It's crashing. Oh, the humanity. That's oh, so yeah. Weird. I, I, was, I, I quoted that today. For uh, real? Yeah, I did. I did. I did say that. <laughs> oh, the humanity! One of the one of the kids is drawing a, a, a <laughs> they're drawing a project, and and they're they're doing like a, I do this riff on on the color wheel. They have to make their own color wheel, and cool. They're, they're doing like they're drawing a house like the one from Up with all the balloons. Oh, sure. And uh, I was making fun of them, saying, you know, why do you have all the balloons coming out of the 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 chimney? You know, if you said that thing, because she said all the balloons were. They all had helium in it. And I'm like, well, if you set it on fire, it'd be like the, he- be like the Hindenburg. Oh, the humanity. And I start saying, and she's looking at me like, like what? I don't know what that means. You know? <laughs> yep. Yep. So. I was going to say, tragedy plus time. Now it's a punchline. Oh. But, yeah, he met him at uh, some, like, radio thing in the 70s, you know, like 40 years after the disaster. Huh. And, and he got to ask him questions and stuff. And he, he was saying how cool it was because we were talking about, like, you know, meeting – you know, like fans being how cool, how and, cool it was to watch this blimp go down in flames. Well, no, meeting <laughs> meeting the reporter <laughs> oh, that had to meeting the reporter that had to cover it. Oh, right, right, right. right. It was more about that, and just like, right. wow, you were there. I mean, my God, I can't imagine what you know what a, what a terrible thing to witness and everything. And he's like, "Who are you?" No, <laughs> <laughs> no, we were t- uh, Mike. We were. Are you one about- of those people on the blimp coming back to haunt me? I'm, I'm sure St- Scoot won't remember this, but you might, Franco. God. It was a great 80s. Well, just because it was this 17-issue series in the 80s from You're DC. You're 12, Scoot. You're 12. And Don't you're 12 make me swear, old. Johnny. Well, again, it's kind of forgotten, and it hasn't been reprinted, and I was asking Mike why it hadn't. It was called Wasteland, and it was a John Ostrander written uh, anth- horror anthology and Bill Ray was one of the artists, and I, like a bunch of the top artists I wanted to do it. I remember this. It was amazing, and it was co-written by this amazing uh, Chicago comedy writer, Del Close. And Del Close is one of the comedy fathers of uh, improv comedy and the Second City. And, I mean, he taught Mike Myers, and he taught Vince Vaughn, and John Favreau, and all the uh, Chicago Saturday Night Live people. You know, all from, you know, uh, what's her face, uh, Tina Fey to uh, Stephen Colbert and all the others that came through Chicago and learned at Second City. Um, he was this amazing teacher. He's in The Untouchables, and he's the accountant. in, uh, And also he's in Ferris Bueller. He's one of the teachers, the boring teachers. And he's the teacher that starts the lecture with, in what Way. Way. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. He had glasses. He had like wire rim glasses. And it's great. He plays this like real maniacal uh, accountant in The Untouchables. He's Al Capone's uh, accountant. And, uh, you know, uh, he's being threatened by uh, Kevin Costner in one scene or whatever. Uh, ma- amazing guy and an incredible character. What a life. Uh, was like got in <laughs> the University of Chicago's uh, tests on LSD. And he's oh, like, boy. I'll sign up <laughs> first. <laughs> yes, please. And he was put in a sensory deprivation tank and dropped acid because, again, under scientist supervision to see what, what had happened and stuff. Yeah. And he said he was totally, like, flying. Uh, John told me the story. And, uh, you know, just, like, in what you know, in touch with the universe, totally on his own Gosh. little mind trip and everything. 
and all of a sudden the sensory deprivation tank is open and he goes and this booming voice that sounded like it was god himself was like what do you want for lunch 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 <laughs> <laughs> and he's like i'll have a tuna fish sandwich 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 <laughs> so uh, and because dell had that kind of crazy mind these stories were insanely amazing um and really really crazy and i'm like mike how come they don't reprint that it's it would be just as shocking today plus there's all these great artists and he goes well i'm sure it's a rights issue and uh he said it's a shame he said he remembered bill ray drawing this intensely horrific uh cover and he's like there's no way in hell giordano's gonna green light this he said but i'll give it to him and uh <laughs> and he said he brought it to dick giordano and he's like wow this is amazing you know we can't print it, but wow, because <laughs> it was so like intensely horrific and everything. Yeah, it was hilarious. So, but yeah, I'm like, dude, it's like literally one of the best series of the '80s from DC, and I hope they're able to untangle the rights because we were talking about um, the Orson Welles movie that's finally on Netflix, The Other Side of the Wind. Is that any good? That's by the way. That's the definition of the other side of the wind. It's really about a fart. I've <laughs> never told anyone that, but it's it's about lighting your farts. I woke uh, myself up one night from the noise. I didn't know what it was. I had too much bean dip earlier in the day. I realized that it was me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's um. I have to confess, I still haven't sat down to watch the movie. I got um. I have a rare Saturday on, uh, night off this week, and I'm trying to convince one of my buddies that's a big movie buff to. <laughs> Hang out with me and let's watch it um, because it's it's a it's a good movie from the seventies, but it's definitely a seventies movie. Um, John Huston plays the lead. It's an incredible movie. All these different filmmakers are in it of the time. Planet Peter Bogdanovich Houston. is in. What's that? Planet Houston. Yes, it's uh, the guy who played uh, Striker in the Wolverine movies. Danny Houston. It's his dad, and he was the director of the Maltese Falcon. And great uh, 80s Jack the Lemmon. Sierra Mob Madre. Yes, yeah, a boy, And also, um, I was going to say Jack Lemmon, but no, Jack Nicholson. Great mob movie from the 80s with Jack Nicholson, Pritzi's Honor. John Huston directed that. Yeah, Amazing and Jellica Houston, his daughter's in it. That's exactly right. Yeah. No, it's uh, he plays the lead. And Bogdan, it's all about a director. A lot of people feel it was autobiographical because it's about like a famous director that's surrounded by the paparazzi asking him questions and stuff about his final movie. And, um, you know, he, it's kind of a suicide movie where he's planning on killing himself, at, you know. And it's a, docu- it's a documentary inside of a, a movie as well. And, you know, it's a, kind of a mockumentary in a lot of ways. And they say Wells was the first one to kind of explore that area of documentary, a parody documentary. And... Um, it was in legal entanglements for like 40 years, 45 years. Why? He made it like in 74 or 75, and one of the principal financiers of the movie was the, the brother-in-law of the Shah of Iran. Oh, wow. And he, yeah, and he owned like controlling rights to the movie. They even apparently, and I had no idea about this, in France, not only is Jerry Lewis king, but also uh, they have kind of a, an arts court where you can take like uh, an orphaned property that you know the rights to the property are kind of tangled up, and plea to the French this French arts court and say, look, you know, let the rights come back to me and, and make your case. And in the eighties, like a year or so before he passed away, Wells tried to do that and was denied. The French are like, no, the Shah's brother-in-law still has the rights. And so before he died, he went to Peter Bogdanovich and said, look, if I you know, if I should die before the rights come back to me, you're you're going to have to finish the picture. And apparently, you know, they finished all filming, and he had a work uh, a rough cut working uh, print. You know that that he had kept Wells. Uh, but yeah, finally, I guess they untangled all the legal stuff, and Bogdanovich went in with the um, cinematographer, and they finished the movie. Oh wow! And so yeah, it's on Netflix and everything, and it's yeah, amazing. They finished it when Reason- they. Yeah, I get, yeah, because I remember reading about a year or so ago that um, all the entanglements were finished, and Bogdanovich and the cinematographer sat down and they 
they finished like you know putting it all together and you know making a narrative oh, that crazy. they could release. And yeah, it's on Netflix now. It just started. It just came out this month. And the the documentary is called "They'll Love Me When I'm Dead." Yeah, I saw that, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I should watch that. But it's I know amazing. I know well. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But I haven't sat down to watch the other side of the wind, the movie itself, and it is on there as well. And uh, there's a part that um, I don't know if you're again a scoot too young, but there was a variety show in the '70s called The Copycats, and it was all the great impressionists. Um, George Kirby and Marilyn Michaels and, of course, Rich Little and Fred Travelina, and they would do, like, comedy bits. So, you know, someone would imitate Bogey, and they'd do, like, a noir comedy sketch or whatever. And Rich Little, of course, would do Jack Benny, you see. Um, but Orson Welles was a guest star on it and was so taken away with Rich Little's impressional, impressionist abilities that he offered him a part in the movie. Oh, he's in the movie? Yeah, yeah, and it well, it's in the documentary, and I'm kind of spoiling the documentary, but he sucked. (laughs) He was horrible. (laughs) So uh, they couldn't, you know, they and they were shooting with him, and then also he had like a either a stage commitment or some sort of you know variety show commitment. So he's like, I I gotta leave the shooting schedule. I'll come back in a week, but I can't stay. And that was their excuse to get rid of him. And Bogdanovich stepped in and finished the role. And, you know, he took over. Wow. And they've got footage of Rich Little acting in the movie and of Bogdanovich doing the same role. So I'm really – I'm even more curious to see the movie, which I'm sure just has Bogdanovich in it. But, yeah, it's really it – was, it was very – it was one of the interesting stories in the documentary. This Rich Little, he's uh, – I think he'll be great in this movie. And then, no, he, he sucks. He's horrible. So – yeah, my first introduction before college to uh, Orson Welles was uh, "We'll serve no wine before it's time." Obviously, the Paul Masson um, wine yeah. commercials, yes. But then also, if I'm not mistaken, he did the commercials for the Dark Tower board yes. game. Yes, which I still have. <laughs> I still have that game, and i I brought it to uh, I brought it to the oh yeah, comic shop to, to play at a, at a board game night but the you know the computer's all fritzed up but we oh, found so this guy who who could possibly restore it. it which would be awesome oh my god yeah because it, it had like a dark tower in the middle of the board and it spoke yep. right yeah it would it, you would move and then you would you would hit the button and it would tell you like what would happen like you'd fall you know i can't remember because it was so long ago but you would fall into a cavern and die sorry type thing you know it would tell you oh, so it's like like dungeons and dragons kind yeah. of narrative but it was actually an actual voice yeah it would it would yeah it would uh or, i don't know if there was a voice but it would it would uh it would tell you what would happen because i think inside it was like one of those those old chinese lanterns you ever get those as a kid where it has a light inside and and the the Jesus. lamp shade itself would would uh twirl and it would like you know show dragons on your wall and stuff yeah. like that yeah, so it was kind of like that. Based oh wow on, on inside, but you would only see one thing at a time. You know, I don't know. It was it was like one of the first computer games. I'm like, this thing is awesome. Sure. Something. And the other game I remember from my childhood that I've never been able to find anywhere is, um, I think it was called Stop Thief, where you had a this handheld. Going. You had a little handheld device, and you would. Um, you go around the board game and you're trying to find this this guy who stole something like diamonds or something like that and you would have to follow the clues and and punch in the things on on the handheld computer type thing to see if you can uh, track this guy down Stop. my cousin had that game and I was very upset because I wanted the game and she wouldn't let any of us you know play with it or touch it <laughs> and I wanted the game really badly so uh, Good story. I like yeah. that. It's a sad story. It was my child. Um, See, this is what I'm, we have to deal with, Scoot. Not like those Nintendo things that you had. Exactly. Up. You kids with your rubber yeah. bands and your hula hoops. And yep. your I had a n- Nintendo when I was in first grade. Oh, I see. I remember when I was in first grade, uh, Odyssey came out. And Odyssey had Pong, Handball, and um, a bad, like... You know, eight bit basketball game that was just you know, Barnstormer. Like, what was Barnstormer? Like, no, that was even before Barnstormer. It was um, it was like Pong. 
where it just had like you know rectangles, um, and and I mean it it kind of had a basket, but not not even like how Activision had bad Activision was Bardstorm or anything, right? Yeah, probably that had that Superman game where you know it was like this pixelated figure that kind of had a cape, <laughs> and it would fly around and be like. <laughs> I mean, it just like made the most ridiculous noise when it flew, <laughs> when he flew, and then when he would walk around as Clark Kent, he kind of had a bad eight bit hat on and stuff, and walking around, horrible, <laughs> horrible. Yeah, sorry you had a, such bad games growing up, Johnny. Crude video. Oh my games. gosh, yeah. It's so. F- I noticed there's a product out that looks like an old Nintendo um, controller, the rectangle mm-hmm. that that had the cross like on the modern N- Nintendo. Uh, or PlayStation controls, but it, you yeah. know, and it and it just had an A and B button and everything, mm-hmm. and it's a whole uh, game system in a giant version of the Nintendo, uh, you know, um, whatever hand, you know, uh, player, you know, the the thing that you would. Right. What's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? Scoot. Controller. The controller. Controller. Thank you. Good lord. Yeah. So it's like a giant controller. But it's an entire, like, it has, like, all these 8-bit games in it of Nintendo. Huh. So, but it's, yeah, it's packaged like a controller, a giant version of the controller. And it's got, like, Paperboy and all the other terrible games. Can you get that for me for Christmas, please? Sure. Okay. Hey, you know what I just saw? Speaking of old toys, there's there's a Honda or a Toyota commercial uh-huh. with, with a $6 million man action figure. Yep. Wow. There's one, right? There's one I had that thing as a kid. Too. Yeah, there's a bionic eye in the back of his head. No, but it's not the real toy. It's like a different one. Maybe they didn't have the rights for the toy, so they they made a different one. But it's Steve Austin's voice. It's uh, it's Lee Majors doing the voice. Stone Cold Steve Austin. I love Lee Majors. He's awesome. I saw a great. He was he and Lindsey Wagner were at a convention and just telling stories of making six million dollar man and bionic woman all these different stunts. And yes, you know, Lee Majors was a stuntman before he became a leading a leading man. He, he sang the lead the the, the theme yes. song to the Fall Guy. Well, he was the Fall Guy, of course. Well, yeah, but he sang the lead song too. Yes, well, that's the thing because he really was he really was a former stuntman. Uh, but yeah, he's telling all these different stunts that he did on Fall Guy and Six Million Dollar Man. It was awesome, very funny. So, and talked about fighting uh, Bigfoot, fight, Andre the uh, Giant, Andre the Giant, and Ted Cassidy. Yeah. Depending on the episode, good stuff. Man, see, that's my childhood right there. I'm with you. Oh God, he was. Um, it's a shame. <laughs> the only thing that sucks about watching Six Million Dollar Man now is the celebration of the leisure suit and yeah. and the seventies track suit because he wore those all the time. Right. So if you want yeah. the, the full evolution of wide lapels and the leisure suit, all you got to do is watch the seven seasons of Six Million Dollar Man. But it was great. And the one year that he came on, uh, the one whole season, he had a must. He had like off season. He grew a mustache. He drew, yeah, the porn stash. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, like only like they made like three episodes before the executives figured it out. They're like, hey, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, well, I grew a mustache off season. And they're like, he's like, you want me to shave it off? I'm like, well, no, you got to keep it now at least for the <laughs> year. So for <laughs> for a year, he looked like poor man's Magnum. One and one, 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 one. And then the final year, he, he was clean shaven again. But yeah, I love it. It's like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> man. Good stuff. And man, Lindsay Wagner, still lovely. Yes. Uh, for, for, you know, 70 whatever, but damn, she is beautiful still. Uh, when I was in Baltimore, I got to speak to Erin uh, Gray. Um, she's still lovely. At, at length. And she's, she's amazing. Yeah. Because we, as hell. you know, we were trying to do this thing. Like I, I brought like a tear to her eye, and she gave me a big hug. Um, we were trying to do this thing at Terrific Con where we were involving, um, you know, all these past Superman. Uh, I don't want to get into the project because we still may do it. But um, I, I know what you're talking about. I wrote to a whole bunch of a whole bunch of uh, uh, people and and uh, representatives and agents and stuff like that. And she represents. Um, Tom Welling and I forget who else. Um, she used to represent Edward James almost. I know the and Gil Gerard. I think she she still does. Um, but um, one one of the people that she represents is Tom Welling, and uh, I wrote oh, wow. to a whole bunch of people, and nobody responded to me at all, <laughs> except for her. 
And she responded uh, each and every time I wrote to her, and I told her that. And I told her she was the only one to respond. She goes, oh, my gosh, you know, you just made my day. She goes, I try and do my job. And I said, that's all I ask for people, you know, like, you know, when you, when you do something like that, you, you're looking for a response. And it's so disheartening when you don't even get an answer, you know. Um, she said, did we say yes? And I said, no. <laughs> and she laughed. But I, I said, at least you responded, you know. I, and I knew it was a long shot and, and that the answers would be no, but at least you responded. And um, and she goes, oh, thank you for saying that. And, and uh, it, it was nice to just t- chat with her for a while. I think I, I told you guys, I think my story, and this is years, it's been a long time, and uh, several dozen episodes since I've told the story, so I'll, I'll say it again for newer Aya oh, yeah, listeners. Um, at one of the Wizard Chicago Comic Cons, I went up to Edward James almost, and this was when Battlestar was winding down and they had already announced that after the series, there was going to be a two-hour TV movie called The Plan. Um, I heard this story, story, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I went to interview uh, uh, almost, and he because uh, he directed it as right. well as obviously was in it, and it was the Cylons' point of view of like the whole right. you know story. And uh, yeah, and I was like, you know, hey, I'd like to do a. Vi-. And my buddy Kaz was shooting the video. And I said, can I interview you? And he said, we got to clear it through Aaron Gray. And I said, oh, so to speak to Admiral Adama, I have to clear it with Colonel Deering for <laughs> Buck Rogers. And he laughed, and he said, well, you know, she represents us. And so I went up, and she was, like, totally in uh, autograph mode. Hi, how you doing? Right. Would you like to buy a picture? And I'm like, well, actually, I'm shooting video for my, my website, and I w- was hoping to clear with you to talk to Edward. I'd love to talk to you as well. And all of a sudden, she puts her glasses on. She's like, all right, tell me about your website. Yeah. You know, what, what kind of reach do you get and everything? And I'm yeah. like, oh, this, this, and this. And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, you can talk to him. Talk yeah. to whoever you want. I should have talked to Gil Gerard. I wish I had. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, she was terrific. And I told her, I said, you know, like you, Charlie's Angels, and Linda Carter. I go, you guys were the strong women of the 70s. And I said, that's that's a cool responsibility. And I go, I hope young women appreciate your role. In that whole, you know, movement. She's like, oh, no, they do. And, you know, they, they come to me. Yeah. And it's cool. You know, right now, MeTV on Saturday nights, uh, they're showing, unfortunately, the Buck Rogers show. It does it? not hold up at yeah. all. Did I, tell, did I tell you in the last podcast who I became friends with? No. On who? Facebook? Gil Gerard. I'm friends with, <laughs> oh, wow. with Gil Gerard on Facebook. You know, he um, used to be much doughier. And he really, I, I know he had a tummy tuck. But I think he finally realized that you know people want to take pictures with him. So, and I don't know what he looks like right now today. Yeah, he's, but I do he's, know he's fitter. He down? Yeah, yeah, because it's like now it's like yeah, he's like senior citizen Buck Rogers, and it's like good for you, Gil. You look good. Was it was it you and I that were talking? Possibly, I don't remember who I was talking. When we were walking through a uh, Barnes and Noble and we were shushed <laughs> by a woman. No, we were definitely talking then. But uh, someone was telling me that they wanted to. Uh, get rid of Aaron Gray on Buck Rogers. And he stood up for her and said, no, if you, if you get rid of her, that I'm like, I, I'm walking. And uh, wow. that the show was in, like, it, they, they kept her on and they gave her a reduced role. Uh, and then it was canceled, like, the next year or something like that after that. Yeah, only two seasons. It was only two seasons. But, uh, um, yeah, I forget who was telling me that. Well, you know, the second season, it was almost like Poor Man Star Trek. Because they were on a ship that was like flying through the galaxy, going to different planets, and it was called the Protector. And they even had like a half bird, half bird, half alien uh, man character called Hawk. And uh, I almost think on Rick and Morty, <laughs> their bird person character is based on based on Buck Rogers Hawk. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember was, Hawk. I just couldn't remember why his hair was made of feathers. Yeah, well, because yeah, he was half bird. <laughs> And what that was were, were his eyebrows feathers or were his eyebrows like regular? I can't remember. No, his his eyebrows were definitely connected to his feathered head. Oh, they in some were weird way, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was honestly for as goofy as the makeup is, he's this stoic, half Spock, half Worf kind right. of warrior character. And he reminded me a lot of uh, of uh, uh, Ben Ben Cisco, uh, but not not in this Avery stuff. Brooks. In, yeah, Avery Brooks when he was on Spencer for Hire. He remember he was hot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it, well, it was they kind of like the same name. I don't know where 
Spencer. In my mind somewhere, I made that connection when I saw Spencer for Hire with Avery Brooks, and I'm like, oh my God, that guy reminds me a lot of Hawk. You know, if he had feathers on his head, that's what he'd be, or something like that. That's hilarious. That's very funny. <laughs> uh, no, it was, and you know, it was it, like I said, it was it was weird, and every now and then he he was very Spock like, uh, right. and also like I would I'd say he's a combination of Spock and Worf. Uh, but then also they had the old British uh, guy Wilfred Hyde White, who was um, Rex Harrison's number two in My Fair Lady. Wow, you can't do it! My God, Higgins, you can't take a street urchin and turn her into a lady. And he was like uh, an old scientist. And then Twinkie would walk up, beady, 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 beady. Yeah, twi- beady. yeah Twiggy, <laughs> Twiggy, or no, Twinky, Twinky. Twinkie. That's yeah, not Twinkie. Twinkie. No, Twinkie. I think his name was Twinkie. <laughs> Twinkie. Twinkie was his uh, his cousin that used to make porn movies. <laughs> Twinkie. I'm, I'm almost positive it was Twinkie. All right, I'm, I'm I believe it was T W I K I, and I am looking it up. I think I will. It's again when that nine out of ten times. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm reasonably confident I will be correct on this one. But hold on, Twinkie. <laughs> Get your twinkie. It was it was a golden yellow sponge cake. I'm pretty sure of it. Hold on, <laughs> let me check. Twinkie, exactly. I like your cream center, Twinkie. Beady, beady, beady. Thanks, Buck. Buck. It was definitely Mel Blanc playing the voice. Yeah. Um, man, the um, the uh, first the pilot movie, especially the original cut of it. Like they for TV, they tamed it down. But I remember seeing the Buck Rogers pilot in the theaters, and in fact at a Jerry Lewis theater, because uh, those were family-friendly uh, movies. Okay, Tweaky Buck Rogers, yes, yes, T W I K I Tweaky. See if I can bring up some audio of uh, Tweaky talking for you for a second here. Mel Blank. As <laughs> I like that it was on a loop. That's awesome. Yeah, he was annoying as hell. He would do beady, 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 and then he'd say, what a body. Because yeah. I remember the princess was in like a really like hot bikini kind of costume or something like that, and she, she had the bod to pull it off. And yeah, beady, 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 what a body. Um, but yeah, the uh, I was going to say. Was, the- was the princess Pamela Hensley? I believe, I believe that's her. Because she was... <laughs> How do you remember Pamela Hensley? Oh, I remember Durant. Pamela Hensley. Oh, I'm looking man. her up. And uh, she, she was the, the yes. Go she, on. She was the the. Don't tell me she she was the sidekick or the not the oh, secretary. Nice. She was a sidekick on on. Uh, Come on, Franco. What's the name of that show? The guy with Come the on, mustache. Uh, yep. Another poor man's Tom Selleck. Damn. Yeah. Um. I'll even give you the actor's name, and I'm, I bet you'll get the series. Lee Horsley. Lee Horsley. Name. I cannot. <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt something? Yes. Matt Houston. Matt Houston. <laughs> <laughs> the channel Decades last weekend. Every weekend, Decades is one of those digital channels. They show the Dick Cavett show. They show Ed Sullivan, which is fantastic. And now, right here on our stage, here's... The animals, the animals, and they do House of the Rising Sun and the doors and whatever. Um, but uh, they do a, a weekend where from Saturday at noon till like Monday morning at 4 a.m., they show the same show, just hours of it, and they call it the Decades Binge. And last weekend they did Matt Houston all Matt weekend. Houston. And I was working Lee, my overnights. I, rem- I loved that show because sure, Pamela was, was on it. I, yep. I was like, oh, God, I remember her from Buck Rogers. I'm watching this show. Uh, she is. Then there was Simon 70, something from Manable. She's, 70, she's seventy-eight. <laughs> is she? Wow. She was born in. Or no, 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 sixty-eight. Excuse me, sixty-eight. She was born in nineteen fifty. So yeah, sixty-eight. Just turned sixty-eight, October third. Uh, but yes, she was Princess Ardala from nineteen seventy-nine till nineteen eighty-one. At the before I forget, so in the pilot of Buck Rogers, when he is frozen, and it's the five hundred years until. The 25th century and everything. He um, and they and they play the theme song, but it's sung. Some guy sings it, and it's the most like wimpy theme song you've ever heard. It's much better having it orchestrated and everything. Then it sounds more heroic. But um, while he's asleep, 
all these like women in these weird futuristic kind of bikinis are just like all over him. And it's almost like an orgy scene. Yeah. I mean, everyone's clothed, but it's like definitely him getting like sexy kisses and rubbing from from all these women. And it is like uh, really creepy looking now. Even I mean, then it was like, hey, what the hell am I seeing here? I'm 13 years old and I'm feeling funny. Uh, <laughs> it's just very inappropriate for this movie. Uh, but yeah, it's online. You can find you can find a the entire pilot movie online, and and you know that's like one of the better episodes of Buck. And there were a couple decent ones. There was one where um, Joe from Rhoda, Joe's hus- or Rhoda's husband, he's a pilot, and he's like an old boyfriend of uh, Aaron Gray's. And they have to go to a big dogfight, but they had to call all these reserve pilots because there was some sickness that was sidelining all the uh, different fighter pilots. And so, um, what's his face? Buster Crab was on the show and kind of a glorified cameo. And he's Colonel Gordon. And they never give him his full name, but it's, it's like that it's Flash Gordon. And he was the original Buck Rogers in the cliffhangers. And it's great because, like, you know, there's like a scene where Buck's about to be shot by an alien. And all of a sudden, Buster Crab's like ship comes and he blows him out of the sky. And he's like, "Hey, thanks a lot, whoever did that." He goes, "Gordon's the name." And he's like, "Oh, nice shooting, Gordon." And he goes, uh, "How'd you learn how to do that?" He's like, uh, "Son, I've been you know up here shooting aliens uh, since before you were born." And obviously, Buck Rogers is from five hundred years ago. He's like, "Oh, you think so, huh?" And uh, Buster Crab goes, "Son, I know so." <laughs> and it's like, "Oh, wow," you know. And also, I remember seeing publicity photos of Buster Crab and Gil Gerard together in their costumes for the episode and they were pretty cool they were like I re- when I went and met Buster Crab he was signing these great pi- pictures of him on Buck Rogers Buck beady 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 and then remember the the other robot would hang on his uh, chest and he was like a like a the size of like a pie plate Dr. Theopolis hello buck beady 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 <laughs> <laughs> You like you like that when I when I pulled that Pamela Hensley out of my ass, so. <laughs> Princess Sardala, and uh, Henry Silva was Kane, who was the original bad guy in the Buck Rogers comic strip. I'll I'll tell you I I, I can't remember the original book. I can't remember well, any of the male male cast members' names, <laughs> but Pamela Hensley and Aaron Gray I do remember. Oh yeah, and then there was yeah Doctor Hewer was the Tim. I can't remember his last name, but he, million TV shows, million TV movies, classic character actor, go-to guy. And he was Basil Exposition on Buck Rogers. Well, you know, Buck, 300 years ago, cancer was wiped out. Well, but it looks like a new alien strain of it must exist, Doctor. Well, we, we need you to go find out. And they used, like, uh, Battlestar Galactica kind of uh, ships. And, uh, and like, because Glenn Larson produced um, Buck Rogers as well, so I think they took a lot of the Galactica footage and um, a lot of the props and things like that, and reused them for Buck. Beady, beady, beady. Beady, beady. I bet they constructed Tweaky out of a bunch of old Cylons. I mean, oh, of course. Yeah. And if, and you know, whatever little person actor played the physical version of Tweaky, it wasn't Kenny. I'm forgetting Kenny R two. What's our two's uh, name? Kenny yeah. Baker. Kenny Baker, thank you. And, of course, from Time Bandits. Oh, look, a little girl. I love Time Bandits. Vastly underrated. Oh, I got to watch it again. I'm never going to watch it's any of these things. Funny. It's still very funny. I'm never going to watch any of this stuff. I think i got to get going, guys. I'm fading. I can mm-hmm. tell. I was going to say, Scoot hasn't said anything for 25 minutes. As we're talking yeah. about Buck Rogers. I would yeah, say so I'll soft. be right back, but I might not because I might fall asleep. <laughs> I think I'm, so... I'm not going to be long after you there, Scoot. So. No problem. Yeah. All right, Scooty. Thanks, All right, Scooty. guys. Take it easy. I, uh, I'll be right back. What do we say on this one to close out? I don't like pink. What do we say? Get the True believer. <laughs> True believers. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> All right. See you. Later, Later man. Later, Bye. It's such a shame both of those Glenn Larson sci-fi shows – Galactica and Buck, you know, if they had had just a little better budget, they would have been better shows. But it is your classic tinfoil as science fiction kind of shows. Yeah. And those costumes are just horrible. Yeah. Oh, my God. How about, remember Ice Pirates? Speaking of Angelica Houston? Yeah, with uh, Robert, Robert uh, yeah, uh, Urich. Uh, Urich. Yeah, Robert Urich. Yeah. Spencer. 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 
<laughs> I loved. I'm a huge Spencer for Hire fan because the. I don't know if you ever read the original books. No. The books are incredible. One of, truly one of the great detective series, and in fact, they're still making them. Even though Robert Parker, the guy who created Spencer, passed away like five years ago or whatever, and it's funny. Uh, Kurt Busiek, massive Spencer uh-huh. fan, and Walt Simonson, massive oh, really? Spencer fan. Oh. oh yeah, and I've Walt and I have talked about. Spencer, and he's the one who kind of convinced me because I'm like, are the books any good now that Parker's dead? He's like, well, it's just like comic books, John. He goes, just another writer took over. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know. It's always different with no- you know, with, for me, it's always different with novels. You know, like I don't know. I mean, and it's I mean, occasionally, like the James Bond's books since Fleming died, there have been some really good ones. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it just always feels like you know, more of a, an impression. Of writing because you know it's not the original writer. I don't know if you feel that way when you read novels. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's it's, it's hard. I don't, I don't read a lot of serialized stuff like you know. Yeah. You know, and, and novels lately, I don't read a lot of at all. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I rarely read novels anymore. And people recommend me John Sanford, who I believe is the guy who created Jack Reacher. And you know other uh, great you know current. I don't think novels. I, Lee, Lee Childs is Reacher, right? The Reacher novel. Oh, is he? He probably is. He probably is. Then I'm thinking. I can't remember John Sanford's detective name, and I'm sure I'm. I I will defer to you absolutely. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, you're slowly learning your lesson, Jenny. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, from now on. Although I was right about Twinkie. All right, yeah. so cut me slack. It's I still Twinkie, Twinkie to me, but yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'll never, I will never call it's, it Tweaky. He was such a stupid character. Yeah. One of my favorite Buck Rogers was he comes home, and his home is like a smart home, and you know there's like a computer running it or whatever, and it's playing futuristic music as he walks in, and he's like, I don't want to hear this crap. He's like, get that old recording out from uh, from the archives, and all of a sudden it kicks into Three Dog Night playing Shambhala, and it's just got that great like guitar opening of this great early 70s pop song, and he's just like bobbing his head. He's like, all right, that's better. And if you knew, if you knew if you knew Shambhala, you'd laugh. You'd, you'd you'd definitely appreciate the reference. But yeah, it was good stuff. God, Buck Rogers. Beedy, beedy, beedy. <laughs> Man, it must have been the easiest money Mel Brooks ever made because he'd literally have like three lines a show, and it was like fine. And you know they'd always look the beedy, beedy, beedy because you didn't have to do that every time. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Mel, just give us uh, two takes of beady, 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 and uh, we'll alternate them as uh, appropriate. Give yeah. us a sad beady, beady, beady. <laughs> sad beady, beady, beady. <laughs> Listen, Mel, can you give us, uh, you know, a, a, a peppier beady, beady, beady? <laughs> yeah, a reflective one where you're, you're really thinking about things. Beady. Okay, in this one, you, you, you lost a testicle, beady, beady, beady. That kind of... That kind of down. <laughs> You're oh, killing me. Sorry. That was awesome. Exactly. And they do. When you really hear them, they're all the same. Yeah, that's better. All right. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's better. The sound man, of course, also played by Mel Blank. Yeah, Mel, can you uh, do this? It's like the, it's the uh, first season Barney voice of uh, the Flintstones. Because before, you know, he's like, oh, hiya, Fred. That's yeah. what he like. He settled into, but the first he's like, "Yeah, Fred, uh, I'm uh, coming back from the slate. If you uh, got a second, right? I love that. I never, I never understood. Yeah, why they, why he changed? Well, you know, b- between the first and second season, he had that massive car accident. Oh, I did not know that. Oh man, and it's and it, there are pictures you can find them. It's those winding canyon roads of California, and he like was a total car nut. And he had like an Austin Healey and a uh, the James Bond car, the the DB5. Uh, yeah, Aston Martin. And Aston Martin, thank you very much. And yeah, he would like get these amazing British cars. And he was driving on this winding Cannon Road, and they didn't have lights on it. And he drove off. Uh, he drove off the road off a cliff. Wow. And he survived, but he was in a full body cast. And there's that. Uh, you might have heard it. He he was taken to the emergency room. And um, the surgeon knew Warner Brothers and knew his name. And he said, oh, my, Mel Blank. Well, how are we feeling today, Bugs Bunny? And he, in this very weak voice, he's like, not so good, Doc. Mm. You know? And it was like, oh, my God. And that's how they knew he was okay. Uh-huh. But he was in a full body cast and was in that for, like, months. 
And so to accommodate him, they brought sound equipment to his home and a big boom microphone over his hospital bed at his home. And they would record sound, uh, you know, sessions for Flintstone episodes. And there's this great picture of him in the full body cast and Alan Reed, Fred Flintstone, leaning over them, you know, doing a session and stuff. It was amazing. And the great thing was uh, I read Mel Blanc's autobiography and he was in this cast for months. And Jack Benny was a good family friend. And, you know, he was a regular on the Benny radio and TV show. And Benny would come to visit him and he'd be like, hi, is Mel home? <laughs> it's like, yeah, Jack, he's laid up in bed <laughs> and, w- and will be for the next eight months. But, yes, he's home. Yeah. <laughs> is Mel home? So, uh, yeah, I uh, no, it was, uh, but I think that might have been one of the reasons why the voice changed. I don't know. But yeah, obviously it sounded more Art Carney-ish as, yeah. as the voice evolved. Yeah. Are you Fred? <laughs> Remember, uh, did you ever see the John Cusack movie, Better Off Dead? I love that movie. To me, more skis. No, no, yes. no, no. To me, more is in One Crazy Summer. Atta boy, yes, yeah. indeed. Same director. Yeah. Savage Steve Holland, who later went on to work on. He's, I believe, he's still with Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Steve Theory. Holland. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. No, he was in it. Great. <clears throat> For he people who don't a know, TV those... series too. Um, oh, was uh, something on Nickelodeon, maybe, or something like that. I want to say that up while we're talking. Um. Yeah, for you know, honestly, those John Cusack teen movies of the seventies. There was one crazy summer, and Better Off Dead. Sorry, I blew one, up your mom, Ricky. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's Better Off Dead. Um, oh, he's uh, Cusack's watch. He, like he's got a girlfriend named Beth that he's trying to win back, and everyone he knows, it's like, oh, not, hey, Lloyd. Now that you're not dating Beth anymore, yeah. can I date her? And even like one of his high school teachers says it and says, I'd like to date Beth. But at one point, he's, he's watching the Flintstones, and all of a sudden, you're Barney Rubble go, Hey, uh, Lloyd, you know, since you're not dating Beth anymore, I think I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> it's like, ah! They're great. Cause they're so break the fourth wall crazy uh, comedy. Yeah. Good stuff. Savage Steve. I'm looking it up. Looking at him, looking him up. Yeah. I know he did do a yeah. There we go. Savage Steve Holland. I know he did do some sort of show. Um. He am, by the way he also animated the whammy on the game show Press Your Luck. Oh, did he? Oh, I didn't know he was oh. he was involved with Legally Blonde as well. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm impressed. Is it Eek the Cat? No. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Eek the Cat was for Fox Kids. So like the television series credits. Uh, Oh, he, by the way, he was also involved in the early Fox television show, The New Adventures of Beans Baxter. And he did an Encyclopedia Brown uh, series. He was a writer on Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Keenan and Kelly wrote five episodes. What, what was future. that last one? Keenan and Kel. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah, that's where I saw his name on that one. That was a Nickelodeon okay. show, yeah. Yeah, man. No, he uh he was amazing. And then that other third teen movie that he did that Cusack's not in, but Anthony Edwards is in it, How I Got Into College. I that's remember great, that, yeah. That's another really fun and also what's her name that used to date Laura Flynn Boyle. Is uh, well, it's the love Lara, for that Lara one. Flynn Boyle. Lara, sorry, Lara, you're right. She There's she no got way. a whole bunch of plastic surgery, right? Yeah, she got very pointy, she a lot of look, sharp edges on her body. She, doesn't look she lost anything, a lot of weight. She doesn't look anything like she used to. Yeah, it's a shame because she was a lovely woman, and she yeah, she got very Skeletor like, or Spidey like, very scary. The Spider Woman. Um, yeah, good stuff. Savage Steve Holland, very funny. Mm-hmm. And yeah, those two, those two, uh, <laughs> those two Cusack movies. David Ogden Styers plays his dad, mm-hmm. and he just and he can't figure him out. And also the woman that's all in, the windows on the garage are broken. <laughs> I and then they have the two the two brothers that learned how to speak uh, English by watching uh, Howard Cosell and uh, ABC Wide World of Sports. Yeah, and they do and commentary in drag racing. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and he's got a they got a PA system on top of their car. <laughs> Truly, a di- a portrait of disappointment. <laughs> Very funny. Two dollars. I want my. Ex- yeah, the paperboy. Two dollars. That's right. All that's from $2. that movie. That's right. You forget about all that stuff. And he worked for the hamburger guy, and it's Porky from the Porky's. Movie. Right, 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 right. Lame and there's that weird Van Halen montage with the hamburger when it comes to life. <laughs> Everybody wants some. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, he was a great, and that's the thing. All of his movies have these weird little animation montages in them, <clears throat> and it's Holland was the animator as well as you know the writer and director of these movies, right. and they're incredible. They're fantastic. No, he's he's truly like one of the funniest guys in Hollywood still, and that's why I was so happy when he hooked up with Eddie Gordetsky and was doing all these you know Dharma and Greg and all these different Gordetsky shows, including The Big Bang Theory. Now he's doing good. I like him. I like him. I like it. We can rap if you're uh, tired. Yeah, going to have to, unfortunately. We can dance if we want to. We can leave those world, worlds behind. I um, don't dance. I scared the crap out of Brother Bear once when we were what driving. Um, that song came on. Beep, 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 you know that song? <laughs> the safety dance. The safety Before dance. Men without and, hats. And uh, he was uh, talking on the phone and the song came on and as soon as he was about to hang up his phone call, we were in the car, and it was a long drive back from somewhere. One of the and gods, yeah. At, at the top of my lungs, I yelled out, Men without hats! And he literally got scared <laughs> and fumbled his phone and then, like, burst out laughing <laughs> because I had, you know, sure. it's funny. But, uh, I get that reaction when I hear Dexie's Midnight Runners. Yeah. Come on, Eileen. Yeah, Eileen. That's the dirtiest song in the world. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> had to had to say something dirty on the Franco Clanco. I like it. Come on, Eileen. Oh man, uh, what happened? Never uh, mind. <laughs> I love that song and their uh, cover of Van Morrison's "Jackie Wilson Said." Yeah, good stuff. That's uh, also a great uh, Simpsons epi- uh, reference because the B Sharps, their barbershop quartet, won the Grammy for Best New Band. And Lisa goes, you beat Dexie's Midnight Runners. <laughs> and, and Homer goes, that's not the last you'll ever hear of them. And it was. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> and when they're singing on top of the rooftop and George Harrison walks by, eh, it's been done. Good stuff. Oh, I'm reading an incredible, it came out a couple of years ago, an incredible Beatles biography. And, I, man, I don't even have the title handy to tell you, but it's, it came out like in 2015 or 16. And it really is this like intense, it, it's this Beatles historian who has written reference books before, but it really takes you back to uh, their beginnings and really like gets into what was popular around them as like, you know, in the like late fifties up and it ends with like, please, please me or love me do the book. Um, but you really get a sense of what it was like growing up in Liverpool in like night in the 1950s. And like, these were the popular movies and Bill Haley came with the comets to do rock around the clock and then on a concert tour. And they're like, wow, when we first heard, the record it was so exciting but then we saw him live and we saw the whole show and it kind of took the edge off because you know bill haley kind of backed into rock and roll and he was more of a you know just kind of 50s jazz band kind of thing that like i said backed into rock and roll so outside of rock around the clock it's like oh it wasn't as cool but then you know just first hearing elvis first hearing jerry uh Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis and just, you know, the impact it had on all of them. And just the weird, like, odd jobs they were doing before they could, you know, be full-time musicians. And right. Certainly gets into their whole, you know, going to Germany and the Kaiser Keller and all that stuff that happened. Ah, they're Beatles! Ah. Good stuff. So, I'm stealing this from online, but um, I, I think this is funny and we should end this way. That wow. um, now that, that Stan Lee has passed... I believe that Deadpool should do all the cameos in all the Marvel movies, complete with idea. fake mustache, aviators, and a gray wig on top <laughs> of his suit. So, I like it. Is, so, that, is, that, is that your idea? or did you? No, it, it was online somewhere, and I, I remembered it, and I'm like, oh, I gotta, 
I'm going to end with that because I think that's funny. Excellent. Tune In by Mark Lewison is this Beatles book that I'm talking about, and it's incredible. Can't recommend it enough. Yeah. So if you're a Beatle fan, go read that. And, and listen to the White Album while you do it. Yes, you should. Well, at this point, you should be age-appropriate, so you should re- listen to Meet the Beatles and their early stuff. Yeah, and then go listen to the White Album. But the White Album's good. 68, so it's the Sgt. Pepper. Uh, or no, that was 67. What was 68? I guess maybe uh, Yellow Submarine. It was Yellow Submarine. Yellow Submarine. Yeah. That's right, because I had Bill Morrison on. Word Balloon talking about uh, his graphic novel adaptation for the 50th anniversary of Yellow Submarine. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right, beady, beady, beady. All right, Tweaky. Follow us when you see us, beady, beady, beady. Here, I'm going to bring back the... Uh, should I bring back... <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for it. This is, this is happy, Tweaky. <laughs> <laughs> That's happy tweet. Now, now do sad tweaky. <laughs> beady, beady, beady. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I like it. All right, can you do sexy uh, tweaky? He has been uh, aroused by Princess Amadala. Okay, this is sexy. Beady, 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 beady. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like a vibrator. Can you can uh, can you let me tweaky for the weekend, uh, Buck? <laughs> no. Well, only if extra... he replaces batteries. <laughs> he's got he's got extra attachments. So. And how come there are no B batteries? That's true, by the way. Oh, Makes no sense. Yeah. I'm just saying. So, yeah, go watch me TV on Saturday nights, and you'll see how horrible. I believe Paul Williams is on an episode of Buck Rogers. I know uh, uh, what's-his-face from Different Strokes. Gary Coleman is on a Buck Rogers. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Oof. Oof. Bad. Not good. Not good at just all. Just watch the episodes with Pamela Hensley, and that's all. There aren't that many, unfortunately, but yeah, she's uh, she she she's very impressive in the pilot. You can find that on YouTube. Yeah, so go watch it. Yeah. All right. All right. Follow us follow when you us, see us. Follow us when you see us. Say good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. All right.